Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's hearing of land use. I am Council Member Rafael Salamanca, and I'm the chair of the committee. Today, we will examine the fiscal 2021 prelim preliminary budget and fiscal and the fiscal 2020 preliminary mayor's management report for the Department of City Planning. Uh, before I begin, I would like to recognize um, Council Member Francisco Moya. He's the chair of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises, and my colleagues on the land use committee who are at the with us today. We have uh, Member uh, Ayala Rivera, Credential Diaz, uh, Chair Moya, and Lance Diaz, and uh, Council Member Gregory. This hearing will review the Department of City Planning's proposed 45 million fiscal 2021 pre preliminary budget. While this figure appears small in the context of the city's overall budget, ensuring that the Department of City Planning is adequately equipped to perform its function is crucial. City planning is about defining our collective future as a city, so it's worth spending a little extra time on it today. Our questions will not only address the particulars of this year's budget, but the overall approach to city planning in New York and whether we are resourced to do the work we need to do to further the needs of our residents. Broadly, si significant and serious questions have been raised by this council about the current practice of selecting only a handful of neighborhoods and engaging in confused year-long and divisional planning processes as our primary mode of accommodating growth. Without comprehensively addressing the needs of the entire city, New York has allowed decade-old regulations to remain in place in many neighborhoods, a status quo the council would like to remedy. I would like to thank the director of the city planning, uh, Maris, Ma Marisa Lago, and Anita Larama, Susan Amaris, and John, John Kaufman for joining us today. I look forward to a, robust, a robust conversation about ways in which we can improve on how we plan for our city. But I know and understand very well that the work we do is hard work, and I want to thank you for doing it. Uh, Chair Moya, would like would um, would you like to give a opening statement? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, uh, Chair Salamanca, and thank you to my colleagues on the committee and subcommittee in attendance today, and thank you to the representatives of the Department of City Planning for uh, testifying uh, here today. The Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises reviews and makes recommendations on modifications to New York City zoning regulation, uh, changes in zoning districts, applications for sidewalk cafes, and resolutions authorizing the city to make franchise agreements. It is important that uh, touches that important that is important work that touches the lives of all New Yorkers. Uh, during this hearing, in, in addition to discussing recent budget actions taken by the Department of City Planning. We will address many of the issues concerning the current zoning landscape of New York City, specifically exploited loopholes in the zoning resolution, which some use to skirt the legal use of space, uh, how the department plans to work with the council to close these loopholes, and looking, uh, looking forward to how the department plans to approach future zoning actions in a comprehensive manner. Uh, we here on the committee on land use and the subcommittee on zoning and franchises are looking forward to a very uh, productive conversation uh, today. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I look forward to uh, your comments. Okay, thank you, um, Chair Moya. And now we will go to the general and planning issues. Thank you so much, Chair Salamanca, Subcommittee Chair Moya, and all the members of this committee. Um, I think, Chair, um, allow the council to say their names if they would like. apologize in advance for subjecting you to the gas fears that for us residents of the Pier 3 Loop today, and my back head shows me I'm not contagious. Um, I also want to thank you, Chair Salamanca, for noting that while our budget is small, we are taking a good care of our roads. Um, I want to touch upon some of our great accomplishments of the past year, as well as some challenges that we face on a year to date. Chief among them are the efforts by our officers and our DQ team of the 2020 census, the creation of housing and in particular affordable housing, a neighborhood planning work, climate resiliency, and community growth planning. 
Adam, what about this notion of a reinstatement of city council chair commitment to achieving a full ethnic Palestine census? I know that is critical to my city. So I represent the Latino Congress, city of Sydney, Australia, and for the needs of our community. I have no other comment than I know this has been a problem for at least five years, perhaps the services as well as the leadership. And as a public professional demographer, I am speaking, I'm having a rough time of the census, advising not just city hall and our own health partners, but also the federal and U.S. Census Bureau. For the first time, the Census Bureau is going to be collecting much of the data online, and this is going to enhance our ability to track health responses across city neighborhoods almost in real time. Our demographers are going to be analyzing the response rates and we'll share their perspective with the New York City Census Office, with the City of Public Engagement Unit, so that these frontline community census officers can further mobilize trusted voices in our communities that have low response rates. So even with this new complexity, we will continue to rely upon you and elected officials to report any issues or challenges with the census that you're hearing or that you're seeing in your area. Turning to affordable housing, we know that our stable, solid housing provides a direct path to equity and equal opportunity. So creating and preserving affordable housing is a top of my Bureau administration priority. Most of our new housing, at least 80% of it, is built as of right under the need as it exists today. This new housing is disproportionately being built in the city's most affluent neighborhoods. Since 2015, 30% of new housing units have been in the 20% of neighborhoods with the highest median incomes. And these neighborhoods are also getting a proportionate share of new affordable housing. Again, since 2015, 20% of new affordable units have been built in these most affluent 20% of neighborhoods. <coughs> these zoning actions are important to sustaining the city's capacity for equitable housing creation. The city council is an important partner in this endeavor. Since 2016, the council has approved more than 100 individual land use applications across the city. These applications create capacity for the construction of tens of thousands of new mixed income homes, and they trigger mandatory multifamily housing. So even more effective than individual rezoning are the homes that will be created through the six comprehensive neighborhood plans that the council has adopted since 2016. If you look at the communities around these six rezoned areas, they are home to 1.2 million New Yorkers. Um, that's the equivalent of twice as many people as live in Boston. The population growth that New York City has been able to support over the past four decades has contributed to the amazing diversity that we're so proud of. Since 1986, I told you that, the city's population has grown by over 400,000, and the share of our residents who are of Hispanic origin or non-white has increased from 48% to over 68%. I had the privilege of working in Mayor Dinkins' administration, and it is Mayor Dinkins who said, I see New York as a quadrant in a day of race and religious growth, of national origin and e sexual orientation. We have to make sure that this gorgeous mosaic remains true to generations of New Yorkers to come, regardless of where they live before calling New York City their home. But the same population growth that makes the mosaic possi uh, possible also has placed strains on our neighborhood housing markets. We share the important concerns expressed by housing advocates, residents, and many of you on this committee about fears of gentrification and displacement in our community. We will continue to work closely with our shared constituencies to make sure that growth benefits our residents 
find that New York City expenses in its capacity reporting are more than any other New Yorker. Neighborhood planning is some of the most important work done by city partners. The work is centered on community engagement and relies on expensive use of data, taking forms, conversations that we have with the stakeholders. Whether in a neighborhood rezoning adopted by the city council or in a land use framework, the department will normally allow these be discussions which drive future neighborhood improvements and potential future zoning actions. There are many diverse neighborhood planning efforts underway. One example that we know is our ongoing in-depth study of the area around four new Metro North stations in the Bronx. At Hunts Point, Parkchester Gomez, Morris Park, and Forest City. These are communities that are collectively home to half a million New Yorkers. 2020 is going to be a banner year for our waterfront and climate resiliency efforts, culminating in the December 2020 release of our comprehensive waterfront plan. Together with the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, the department is undertaking extensive public engagement to ensure that New Yorkers' voices are well represented in the comprehensive waterfront plan. And I'll note that the Waterfront Management Advisory Board benefits from the fact that a member of the city council is a member and that there are additional members appointed by the council. Another critical part of the department's ongoing climate resiliency initiative is zoning for coastal flood resiliency. This is a citywide text amendment that we expect will enter the public review process in the coming months. Building on years of engagement with coastal communities, the new rule, the proposed rule, will allow homeowners in the floodplain to more easily retrofit their homes. For example, a family in the Rockaway may want to raise and floodproof their home to protect against future sea level rise. But if they do so today, they would lose their basement, which they may have been using as a recreation room. Today, they wouldn't be able to replace this lost space because of long-standing zoning rules that didn't account for flood risk. If adopted, these new clear as-of-right rules will help homeowners throughout the city take strides towards a safer, more resilient future. I'll end my remarks by mentioning the department's community voice training. Last year, I mentioned a series of ongoing training sessions that the department launched to better engage community board members. The goal of these sessions, which were augmented markedly at the request of this committee, is to strengthen community boards through consistent and ongoing training on fundamental planning principles. This fiscal year, the department has already trained more than 200 community board members, offering insights into some of the database research that we've prepared and introducing community board members to our online digital tools, which enhance public transparency. The feedback has been overwhelmingly favorable, and I thank this committee for in 2017 urging us to embrace this very active, robust training of our community groups. And with that, I'll hand you to Jeff Dixon. Thank you, um, Chair Lindsay. My, uh, my first line of question here is to Carson's statement um, about affordable housing. You mentioned that 20% of new housing units that have been built have been built in affluent neighborhoods. Can you be more specific? What neighborhoods are, what affluent neighborhoods are you, you, you mentioned that you've built affordable housing in since 2015? What we have done is look at the 20% of neighborhoods with the highest median median income. And when we have looked at the approvals and permit issues in each of the events that we would be glad to share that with you, with the committee as a whole. And can you give me a specific number? I don't have that number. Thank you. 
Is it possible that you're going to send me some junk a text and you guys actually get to do the mitzvah because you did the Bible because you see me being lazy? I'm just curious to know because, <laughs> you know, when we're talking about building affordable housing and we're talking about when we we're, we're discussing and we're realizing the zoning, you know, it, it seems to me that city planning focus is in low income black and, and, and brown communities. What I would like to recommend is a, a, a couple of different answers to your question. What I would like to recommend is maybe 80% of housing construction that takes takes place at the Bronx. Turn that to the rezoning districts that obviously are a disproportionate number of blacks. Um, those districts come up with the rezoning. We always look to council members to invite us to come and see in our community to look at things like a rezoning. The six rezoning that have been completed with council approval have been done hand in glove with the help of council members. Now, you know, if you're from you know, a council member interest in state undertaking a comprehensive plan on the part of council, we also look for other indicia. One is the fee waiver. We want access to public transportation because we know that the best location for a group to make progress about this is near in particular subway station. Uh, thank you for that. After several years of community engagement and analysis conducted by DCP related to the Southern Boulevard study, the department has gathered a lot of important information. When does um, when do you plan on um, releasing the Southern Boulevard study? I want to start council members by thanking you and your community group for the work. It's been around eight years of engagement on Sullivan Boulevard. And we realized that um, even without a rezoning, there is very important regulatory inputs, the understandings of the community. And so we anticipate in the coming months that we will be coming out with a document that um, memorializes the work that we've done and that identifies the challenges and the opportunities that the community could face. Um, we are hopeful of the fact that the issues identified by the community went beyond land use issues and is, uh, is why they need planning and deal with, with a host of sister agencies, transportation, the school, the urban park, access to open spaces, issues of health. And when we release this document, we think that it will be quite helpful as if and as private applications come forward to have this memorialization of what the vision is for the future of the community. Yes, you know, I, I know that I publicly came out in opposition to the zoning component of the Southern Boulevard study, uh, but to be quite frank, I'm looking forward to the report because, you know, it's not every day that you get multi-agencies to come into your community and analyze every corner uh, of your district uh, and, and come up with recommendations on how to improve the quality of lives, whether it's transportation, uh, whether it's lighting, parks, public safety, health. And so I do look forward to that study. Does city planning do or are you planning or doing studies of neighborhoods without the zoning component? I saw a council member that you think is drawing a distinction between planning and zoning, and that we share our sense that solid planning has got to reveal enough if it works in a rezoning. And we see that in Southern Boulevard, we worry so much about the neighborhoods. The same has happened in other neighborhoods across the city in which we think that they fail. And let me give one example, which is the North Brooklyn industrial area. We did a very comprehensive look at this tragedy, but also very varied industrial area. The report that we put out while specific to North Brooklyn has informed how we've looked at industrial areas across the city. I would also note that when it goes deep dive into issues, there, there is insufficient depth of information. Um, I'll give an example with respect to resiliency. We look at resiliency when a zone, and quickly adopts the five businesses in the floodplain. 
and put out a report that has been well and well received in the business community. We looked at different typologies of business, business options, small businesses to larger industrial concerns. They were used in one of the foundations as part of that planning, but it was, it is an important document that is out there that is a tool to aid businesses. One other example I'd like to give is the work that the Department of Education School with the Tech Support and Agencies. We have heard a lot of talk about the retail vacancies extended, mostly that's the word that's been said, extended to be about uh, Manhattan on retail resources. But what we did is take a look at 24 different neighborhood retail tips across the five boroughs to identify out of all of the money in the river, what the situation is. We found that particularly outside of Manhattan, there were thriving neighborhood retail tips. And I mentioned Black and Brown Tips, that's one example. And to us, it was not a design proposal, but an important lesson that we needed to understand our neighborhood retail tips in their individual context. And I'm not trying to get get to all the places, to get to all the places, which wouldn't work in a city as complex and varied as New York. Um, so let me see if I get through some of my questions and give my colleagues an opportunity. I know that uh, time is limited here. What are the remaining neighborhood rezonings that you expect to certify before the end of this administration? discussions with Council Member Frank and Sam Bowen. And again, this is a report that I am not going to repeat in this report in which the department and the council is a is the same. Um, as I mentioned- and, and you see that happening before the mayor's uh, term is up as well? I can't imagine that happening. Where are you right now in this stage? We're in active discussions of finalizing our environmental analysis and of working with the two council members to before launching the public review process. You haven't certified yet? No, we, we have not certified. Okay, um, let me get through my questions, I'm sorry. Um, there are many times that council members are interested in downzoning certain parts of their district. And I remember something that got me all to the finish line in terms of my opposition to the Southern Boulevard rezoning was my conversation with Deputy Mayor Edna Miller. Um, would you be about downzoning? She mentioned that the city is not in the business of downzoning zoning. Is that, did you share that sentiment? We have and frequently have obviously discussed in the community the issue of the downzoning. As a department that looks citywide, as a city that is growing, and as a city that has an affordability crisis, we need to recognize that the solution is not to shut all businesses down. But what about those if those those districts that are zoned to an R seven and there and those and those blocks are two and three bed uh, two and three family homes and we're having issues with developers who are purchasing lots in between and building buildings that are out of character with the neighborhood. Does the city n city planning not care about keep keeping the character of neighborhoods intact? Whenever we look at a neighborhood, we look at it holistically, council member. And what we do is we look to identify areas where there are opportunities, particularly in areas served west of Park Transit, where there are opportunities to provide housing, in particular affordable housing. Because as you know, it has been decades in the making that we have not kept up with producing housing and the population has grown by 400,000. At the same time, if one looks at the neighborhood, the district neighborhood rezoning, they have in each instance taken a very fine grained approach, looking for upzoning opportunities along major transit corridors, and most especially in West Broadway Station, <laughs> while at the same time recognizing the character of the mid blocks and engaged and, and have resulted in a nuanced, a balanced contextual zoning of the mid blocks coupled with an up zoning to trigger MIH along the major corridors. All right. I am going to uh, hand off some of these questions to my colleague, uh, Chair Moya, 
and then um, we'll, we'll go to other questions from council members. Thank you, uh, Chair Salamanca. Thank you again, Commissioner, for your time. I uh, just want to touch on the um, NDF. Um, can you tell us how much money is left in the Neighborhood Development Fund, and where do you expect to spend these funds? Um, certainly. Um, on, whoops. Um, if I could turn that over to, oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong pages in my notes. Apologies. No, I'll get time that for you okay. in a second. I don't want to misspeak yep. on the exact number. Um, currently, we have $360 million in the NDF, and it is comprised of around 91 million, which is in EDC's budget. Wait, and could you repeat that? 91 million in EDC's budget, and about 269 million in DEP's budget. From the outset, the monies were held in these two other agencies' budget budgets. Thank you. Uh, so I've been working with my community and the city agencies to realize uh, the goals of the Willits Point rezoning. Uh, you know, this project is in need of substantial uh, remediation, environmental remediation, and other uh, infrastructure cost. Would DCP be willing uh, to consider allocating a portion of the NDF uh, to help expedite <laughs> the first phase of affordable housing uh, in Willits Point? The NDF is one of the city's tools um, that is deployed in the context of neighborhood rezonings. Um, we work hand in glove when there is a neighborhood, a city-sponsored neighborhood rezoning to identify the sources of funding that are needed for remediation for infrastructure in the neighborhood. The sources can range from the NDF to the city's capital budget. As you know, as part of any neighborhood rezoning, we work with the full panoply of city capital agencies, including DOT, DEP, school construction authority, and the funds ultimately come from the same place, which is the city's capital budget. So is that a yes? Again, the NDF is but a source of funding, and- I hear that, I'm just asking, is that a, is that a yes? Is that a possibility for at, us at to- At this point, we don't have a neighborhood rezoning for Willits Point, and so were there to be a comprehensive neighborhood rezoning, the NDF could be one of the sources of funds. Thank you. Um, moving on uh, to the use groups. As you know, the, the nature, and you talked a little bit about this before, the nature of uh, brick and mortar retail uh, is drastically changing across the country. Uh, destination big box retail uh, companies have been classified as a use group 10, 10A by the DOB, uh, which restricts their location to a C4 district. Uh, or other commercial districts that are meant to attract uh, customers from outside of the immediate uh, local community. Uh, big box retail companies are developing new models uh, where they construct a small ground floor space and large department stores uh, in the seller space. DOB is now interpreting these big box retailers as variety stores in use group 6A that are allowed uh, in almost <coughs> all commercial districts. Does DCP, agree with DOB's interpretation of these big box retailers, uh, retailers uh, on how they are now being classified, uh, or that the interpretation is in the spirit of the law? I would actually defer to DOB. Their role under the charter is to be the interpreter of the zoning resolution. Okay, so DCP never makes an interpretation on no, it is DOB. We adopt, well, it's actually the council that adopts the zoning resolution, but interpretations are the remit of the Department of Buildings. Okay. Uh, so does uh, building big box retail in uh, seller space uh, minimize any of the environmental impacts, such as traffic, uh, that could be associated with big box retail that is built above the seller space? If I understand your question, it would be if there were a discretionary zoning review, would the EIS have to look at traffic impacts? Um, the environmental assessment would have to. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to move quickly. Just I know we have uh, some folks uh, now going on to something that we've talked about for a while, voids. Um, in a letter from DCP to the council on May 13th, uh, 2019, DCP agreed to conduct a study of unenclosed voids in residential buildings, uh, exploring potential abuse of the zoning resolution while considering the many uh, desirable architectural and functional uses of unenclosed space uh, to be shared in the summer of 2020. Uh, what is the status of this proposal? We actually have work underway, as I mentioned in my formal written testimony, but not um, in my briefer oral remarks. We are very much a data-based agency, and before putting forward a zoning proposal, go out and assess the nature of the challenge. Um, and so we will be coming back to the council as committed this summer. Um, I want to give a flavor of part of the um, complexity of looking at an issue of unenclosed voids. Um, a good example is actually just across the street. If one looks at those beautiful soaring Gustavino arches in the municipal building where one goes down to the subway, that's an example, one example of an un unenclosed void. So just to be clear, there, it, there's no status right now of where we are with the proposal? It's coming no, out. The work is, is underway. Is it on track so, to. No. Okay. Um, well, we committed to release the study this summer, and we intend to. Great. Thank you. Um, and how would DCP define abusing the zoning resolution uh, to, the, to artificially inflate building heights? I think we had a recent example. If we looked at the work that we did on mechanical voids, we saw a small number of developers look to create artificially tall mechanical spaces and seeing that that was not the intent of the zoning resolution we worked with the council members but we also worked with building engineers to come forward with a proposal that was adopted by the council to address those unintended consequences okay. uh and do you, do you believe that the proposed building on uh, 249 uh, East 62nd Street is abusing the zoning resolution in, uh, that, in this respect? I would actually leave it to the Department of Buildings again, which would interpret building permits. Okay. Uh, in the same letter uh, the, uh, to the council on May 13th, DCP agreed to conduct a study related to the establishment of um, minimal lot size for non-residential zoning lots, uh, exploring how small, uh, otherwise unusable zoning lots may yield unintended building forms in certain zoning districts. Uh, the preliminary results were shared with the council in 2019. Can you provide an overview of the study uh, and the preliminary direction that was shared with the council last year? We looked at small zoning lots and identified ones where um, there was a very appropriate reason for having the small zoning lots and in others where they appear to be intended to avoid other provisions of the zoning resolution. Um, this is one of the challenging bits of research that is actually actively underway. And I do want to give a shout out to the council land use staff, which is so helpful. In always, <laughs> always, Commissioner. They, they are the best. Uh, so, and just to, just to, to go with that, uh, what, is the, what is the current status of, of, of that study? It's still underway. Still underway? Okay. Um, I got just two more questions and that's it. Gladly. Uh, in August of 2018, January uh, and January uh, 2019, uh, a joint letter from council members of the Manhattan delegation and the Manhattan Borough President asked the Department of City Planning uh, to pursue a holistic solution through the introduction of uh, zoning text amendments that considered all the following uh, issues. Uh, limits on mechanical voids and other kinds of voids, a tightening on the definition of zoning lot and restriction on floor and ceiling heights in response uh, DCP pursued a text amendment to address enclosed mechanical voids in residential buildings within R9 and R10 districts and equivalents uh, outside of the central business district uh, or uh, CBDs. 
Later, DCP agreed to explain this proposal to the CBDs, then to study unenclosed uh, voids and small issues, offering a partial piecemeal approach. So my question is, why this approach, and why not fix the zoning rules so that they can provide clarity, consistency, predictability uh, that they were intended uh, to provide? I'll answer a number of different threads that are um, reflected in the letter and in your, in your question, council member. Um, with respect to central business districts, we are actively working with individual council members and with council land use staff and with the Manhattan Borough President to look at the issue of mechanical spaces in central business districts. I was particularly ha um, heartened by the fact that council member and borough president joined department staff and building engineers in touring mechanical spaces in newly constructed buildings. Certainly my takeaway from it was that these were not mechanical voids, but actually incredibly intensely packed and cramped spaces that provided um, the, the backbone, the infrastructure of these buildings. And in speaking with building engineers um, and with structural and mechanical engineers, we learned that the new requirements for higher energy efficiency codes are requiring even larger mechanical spaces. Um, and so we are continuing work on a proposal in the central business districts, but very much informed by the tours that we took with a council member and the borough president, and by the real life experiences of the building engineers who operate these mechanical spaces. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna end there with this. But the, the state Supreme Court ruled that the zoning lot for uh, 200 Amsterdam, which was made up of uh, partial tax lots, was illegal, uh, consistent with the policies proposed by the Department of Buildings. Why doesn't DCP propose an amendment to the zoning resolution uh, to provide clarity on the definition of the zoning lot and, instead of just deferring this critical decision to the courts and to the Department of Buildings? I would note that this is a provision that has been on the books since I would believe the 1961 adoption of the 61 zoning resolution. Um, I will also note that the Department of Buildings has issued um, an interpretation, a reinterpretation of this provision. Um, I would not, I, I do not believe it judicious to undertake a citywide zoning text amendment of this sort. It would require a tremendous amount of analysis and environmental review. Uh, thank you. Uh, for your testimony. I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Salamanca and thank you. Her. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, right before I get to um, my other colleagues, I um, question regarding the uh, uh, Bushwick. What is the department's rationale for walking away from the Bush from Bushwick after years of work? The department has very much welcomed the years um, because it isn't uh, measured in months, but rather years, with Council Member Reynoso, with Council Member Espinal, with the community board, and with various advocacy organizations throughout the community. We learned very much about this neighborhood, this transit-rich neighborhood, and this neighborhood that has, over the past decade, experienced very significant housing pressure and housing growth without any affordability requirement. Um, I will note, I will make reference to a letter from the deputy mayor in which she noted that the Bushwick Community Plan was in essence a down zoning and that at a time when our city is facing a housing crisis and an affordability crisis, that that was not a direction that we could pursue. But, but Commissioner, going back to that again, the city planning, in, in terms of killing the character of neighborhoods, yep. you know, when we're talking about, I think Bushwick has something very similar to Southern Boulevard in terms of, you know, it, I believe my Southern Boulevard has a 1967 uh, rezoning. Um, and right now, that what it's zoned for is inadequate. So you're saying that DCP's position on city led rezonings are only possible if we're adding additional density to the neighborhood. 
We always look for a balanced rezoning that recognizes the fact that we have to address our housing crisis, and in particular, an upzoning that triggers mandatory inclusionary housing. I would note that, again, in Bushwick, we have seen over 6,600 new primarily market rate housing units built, but without any affordability. In looking comprehensively at the neighborhood, we identified areas along the two subway corridors that bisect the neighborhood where there were opportunities for significant growth and also mid-block areas. But again, the community plan, which proposed markedly less upzoning and identified as soft sites, sites that we do not believe under any reasonable interpretation would be redeveloped, was fundamentally a downzoning wasting the opportunity to address both the neighborhoods and the citywide need for affordable housing. So if a neighborhood existing zoning is causing disrupt disruptive out of character development, is that not a reason enough to update the zoning in such cases as Bushwick? You just we, admitted that we need to update that rezoning, but yeah. you would only do it if you upzone, not, we, not fix uh, the zoning. Council member, if I might again explain, we do it as part of a comprehensive plan that identifies appropriate areas for upzoning along wide avenues and along transit corridors, balanced with a very finely grained look at mid blocks and areas further removed from transit. All right, I'm gonna get on to my, my other question. Um, Chair, I, I asked you this question last year and I had more time to think about it throughout the, the year. I want to know the, uh, the independence between the Department of City Planning and the Commission. Because you wear two roles here, right, in two hats. You are the, the head of the Department of City Planning, the, the agency, and, and you are the chair of the Commission. Now, is there uh, any independence or is the mayor running the show here in both, both the commission and the, the agency? Thank you for clarifying that I, too, I do wear two very different hats. I am the director of the department and run the day in day out planning work of the department. I am also the chair of a 13 member planning commission that is a deliberative body. Um, the planning commission's membership is comprised of seven mayoral appointees, including myself, one appointee by each borough president and an appointee by the public advocate. The one thing that I would note when one looks at the decisions of the City Planning Commission is that they are, they reflect the fact that the commission is a deliberative body. Um, our deliberations occur on the record, are sessions at which we discuss proposals, either before putting them into ULERP, before a public hearing before the commission, and after the public hearings before our votes are all done on the record. And I am pleased that the members take their role so seriously and that one doesn't end up with seven, six votes. Um, I think it reflects the good work of the department in shaping proposals before they enter the process, but also that the commission takes its deliberative role seriously. I'll also note that um, all of the matters that go through ULERP, the commission prepares a written report that describes the application, describes the input from the community board, from the borough president that reflects the comments at our public hearings and then has a consideration section in which it describes its rationale. We find this incredibly helpful because we are setting a public record of what the considerations are that went into the, um, into the decision. Some have said that the dual role undermines the independence of the city's planning commission. Has the commission approved an application certified by DCP since your appointment? Yes. Um, we disapproved an application in Coney Island. 
Okay. What, 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 what project was that? It was a proposed rezoning on a mid-block in Coney Island. At the time of certifying the project, which means the formal commencement of ULERP, um, the department expressed its concern, thinking that it was a site that was quite far removed from public transportation, and that was on a mid-block, and that the requested rezoning was too dense. Um, the applicant chose to proceed through the ULERP process, um, and when it returned to the commission, the commission turned down the, the application. Thank you. I want to recognize that we've been joined by council members Cool, Barron, and Miller, and we're going to go to our, our first round of questions. Um, we're going to start with council member Rivera, and we're going to um, five minutes for questioning. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so you mentioned that there's a decline in well, there's a decline in plans that DCP presents to the public. That's what we we've seen on some of our information. Um, does this free up resources for reviewing community-based plans? Council member, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. to sure, we have the, the performance. We have the performance measures in front of us, and the number of economic development and housing proposals presented to the public has decreased since fiscal year 2018. That's a highly variable number year by year. Um, what we are seeing is that the projects that are coming forward are increasingly complex. Um, not surprising, given that the city is already so substantially built out, that the areas where we are seeing proposals going through ULERP tend to be harder to develop sites. And so the complexity of the projects means that they are taking additional resources. So they're increasingly complex. Well, I just had my community board, one of mine, community board three, approve the special enhanced commercial district for the East Village. What's the process for DCP to review this plan and what would the timeline be for review and approval? I would be glad to have the Manhattan office. You know that we are, we have a borough based system in addition to our planners at headquarters speak about that or, or speak with the proponents of this plan. And following that, we could better assess whether what the path forward might be. That would that would be great because they've been working they were working on this when I was a community board member in like twenty twelve. So I would really since it is from the bottom up, which typically doesn't happen and we and we receive a lot of these plans from your office, I think it's helpful to show support for something that truly came from the people that are on the ground. So does DCP I saw in your testimony you talked a little bit about the trainings that you're giving to community boards and do you, so you're providing expertise and resources to community boards and other organizations looking to create these community-based plans? Yes, if I could elaborate on the trainings for the community board, and um, as I mentioned, this grew out of a request from this committee to markedly enhance the trainings. What we did in the first year of the trainings is we focused on community board chairs and land use chairs because of the role that they play. Um, we have, we then expanded the trainings to new members of the community board and in this past year have expanded it to all members of the community board. And we have two different types of trainings. One type is done out in the boroughs um, and we call together the community board members from that borough. In some boroughs, the borough presidents have actually joined with us in co-hosting the trainings. In addition to that, we then have trainings at our headquarters at 120 Broadway where we bring in community board members from across the city and those tend to be more in-depth training on particular subject areas, not just a planning, zoning, ULERP, environmental review 101. Um, examples over this past year of the kind of trainings that we've provided um, were updates on the storefront vacancy report that we did because that affected, it touched all five boroughs. Um, we have done very significant work on the metro region and the relationship between where jobs and housing are 
Uh, we did a special training for the community boards on that. And then one that we was training on the digital tools that the department has developed to enhance transparency, like our community district profile, like our population fact finder. I'll note that at the end of each of the trainings, we provide um, a feedback form, and it's not often that one gets 100%, but when it comes to the training, they have been that well received. Well, I, I think that's, that's great that, that you're providing that kind of training. I mean, now with term limits, I do feel like it'll have to ramp up and again, we have this plan for this special enhanced commercial district in the East Village that we've been working on for a very, very, very long time. So I know that you said that you would get back to us with, with the Manhattan uh, liaison. I just want to ask what resources are dedicated to reviewing community-based plans. And I could give an example of, of, um, of a 197A plan. What kind of resources are dedicated to that? And thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. No, gladly. Um, there is a reason why we have borough offices, and that is to be out to be aware of the community boards to interact there, and that would be our principal liaison. I'll note, though, that we also have central planners who focus on issues of waterfront and resiliency, who focus on urban design, who focus on economic development, on housing, and those are additional resources that can be brought to bear when reviewing a community plan. Well, I was just asking to see if there was an actual number of personnel. I don't, because you said there's, a, there's an office, but I want to just make sure that they have people they can talk to. You, you mentioned a, a bunch of staff um, doing analytical work for the census too. So I just hope that with, with, with all of these people that are assigned as resources that you work very, very closely with us and, and, the, and our community board since we are the people on the ground. And, and thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Chair, for, for being gracious with the time. Thank you, Council Member. Um, just want to be uh, recognized that we've been joined by Council Member Levin, and now we'll have uh, Council Member Diana Ayala question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chair Lago. Um, this is re my question is actually related to the NYCHA transfer of development rights. So numerous planning experts have recommended exploring the expansion of the transfer of development rights to allow NYCHA to more broadly sell its air rights to raise uh, money for capital improvements. Has DCP studied this issue, and what is DCP's position if they have? Thank you for that question. Um, I want to reaffirm our support for the current transfer of development rights to adjacent zoning lots, which currently exists. And so that is a tool that we think for certain NYCHA developments in high opportunity areas holds promise. Um, with respect to a TDR scheme, a new TDR scheme more broadly, we actually have very practical concerns about that. When one has a TDR, proposal, it is dependent upon a private landowner saying that it wants to purchase the rights, that the economics are such, and so there is absolutely no certainty or even predictability about when a revenue stream would come through. Um, in addition to that, we believe that there are potential legal issues. Um, we know that TDRs, transfer of development rights, have to be premised on a land use um, basis and cannot run afoul of the zoning for sale restriction. I mean, I, th I think that I share two concerns. One, I'm concerned about the, uh, the, the, the I have, a, I have a, a, a NYCHA property in my district and they're in conversations to sell air rights for $3 million and the $3 million would be allocated to the uh, adjacent uh, NYCHA development. Three million dollars, we all know, I mean, when we, a few years ago, I thought it was a lot of money. I know better now. I don't, I don't know if that's considered fair market value. I don't know who is determining what the right amount is. And it also concerns me that a private developer um, is buying air rights and then developing, who's ensuring that what that private developer is considering developing on that property is in the best interest of the community. Because is, 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 a, is, is there two conversations to be had, yes. 
NYCHA could always benefit from any additional revenue. However, it should never come at the expense of the community. And so are we doing our due diligence to ensure that when we are considering these, these uh, transfer of air rights, that there's also a conversation with the developer about what the intent of the use of that land is? I'd be glad to pass along these concerns to NYCHA. Okay. Um, and my uh, my final question is regarding the uh, the, so the, uh, the the comprehensive water plan uh, waterfront plan. So DCP is, is currently in the process of developing the next comprehensive waterfront plan required every 10 years by the New York City Charter. Could you provide how much is being spent and how, and if any priority at all is being offered to East River North? Um, I have an esplanade and a pier that are both falling into the water. And this is the first time that I'm hearing of this plan. Um, so I would like to hear more and, and better gauge why and how the community can become more involved in this process. Thank you for asking about the comprehensive waterfront plan. This is a plan that is a requirement to be produced and updated every 10 years. So there is currently a comprehensive waterfront plan and this is the 2020 update. The plan is developed in conjunction with a waterfront management advisory board. And it is a fascinating group of folks. It includes a council member and appointees um, by the council as well. And it encompasses people that range from environmental justice advocates to the maritime industry, to people interested in recreation, to just across the board. We have 520 miles of waterfront mm -hmm. and its uses are just so varied. The plan is not going to come out with specific recommendations of put this much money into this particular proposal, but rather look more comprehensively at what the uses of the waterfront, what protections are needed for the waterfront. Is there more emphasis that's gonna be placed on the res resiliency and preparing for climate change as part of this process? Absolutely. Um, it's, if I might continue, yeah. um, both, the last update of the plan was in 2010, before Sandy. Sandy was a game changer in how we have to think about the reality of climate change and its impact of the city on the city. And it's not just more frequent and more intense storms. We also have to consider sea level rise from climate change. We have to consider areas of our city that are already subject to full moon tidal flooding mm -hmm. at the edges of the neighborhood. And so I think that that will be a key difference in this update of the plan. I mean, I would, I would love for an opportunity to sit down and discuss it further offline. I think that I want to reiterate that East Harlem, I, I grew up in the Lower East Side, I was really excited about their resiliency planning. I uh, was really disappointed that East Harlem was not part of any conversations, um, considering that we also did flood and that the communities that flooded were the communities that you know po are populated with the lowest income residents. Um, in my community, and so I would welcome an opportunity to have a further discussion about how we are a little bit more strategic about identifying funds um, to move this along a little bit faster. We'd welcome reaching out to you to get you more information, and in particular about the Waterfront Management Advisory Board. It. Thank you. Commissioner, I mean, um, Madam Chair, um, on May 7th of last year, at a secret oversight hearing before this very committee, representatives from city planning shockingly admitted that we do not go back and try and figure out whether precisely what we had projected comes to be in 10 or 15 years or five years. So how are communities supposed to take comfort in the pledges you make when this is what was said by your personnel at your agency? Um, and that was a comment made by the general counsel, your general counsel, Susan Amron. Thank you for that question, counsel. Um, it gets to what is the nature of an environmental impact statement. Um, I think that many labor under the misperception that an EIS is a crystal ball that predicts the future. Rather, it's a disclosure document. It's a disclosure of 
reasonable assumptions about what will change. Um, and so it is not a predictive document that says this is what will happen. I thank you also for mentioning the time frames. Rezonings don't occur in particular neighborhood-wide rezonings. It's not as if they occur and bam, next day, everything has changed. Rezonings play themselves out over time, five, 10, 15, 20 years. The one thing I do want to note though is that we have a seeker manual which is continually looked at to be refined as science changes. And so it, while the NEIS will never be a crystal ball predictive document, we always look to make sure that it reflects the best and current science. Along with uh, public advocate Jamani Williams, I am the uh, sponsor, the co-sponsor with him on intro 1572, which would require a racial impact analysis as part of the city's environmental impact study. Does city planning support this measure? We very much understand the fear of displacement that community members associate with change in their neighborhoods. And I'll note that change in neighborhoods occurs whether or not a rezoning is being discussed. I'll give us an example, East Flatbush, where change is occurring and we have not been speaking or working on a community rezoning. Um, we also very much agree on the need critically to analyze land use actions and we also need to analyze the status quo, what is happening even in the absence of a discussion about rezoning. The fight against displacement has to go so far beyond zoning. Um, the administration is fighting displacement, as you know, with record levels of affordable housing production, free legal services for tenants, um, programs to combat harassment. I'm especially proud of the fact that while the federal government has walked back from its commitment to fair housing, through the Where We Live initiative, we in New York are looking at fair housing policy. How can we fight discrimination and build more inclusive neighborhoods? Um, I would welcome the opportunity to engage with the council on identifying whether there is a causality between racial displacement and rezoning. We, we don't see that the rezoning is the causality. Neighborhoods change for a whole variety of purposes. Neighborhoods change because of national economic trends. Neighborhoods change because of societal changes. Um, societal changes with respect to retail, which we've discussed, societal changes with respect to average housing sizes. And displacement can be caused by any of these factors individually and collectively, not just by rezoning. So do you support this, um, this bill? We look forward to ongoing discussions with you about how we can address in a land use and in non-land use settings, the concerns about displacement. All right. We've been joined by uh, Councilmember Deutsch, Richards, and Traeger, and um, we're going next up will be Councilmember Miller for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and that is a great segue into my questioning because I recall when um, City planning last testified uh, before this committee, there was a lot of conversation about um, the fact that the agency was highlighting as success some of the um, past um, rezoning, such as downtown Brooklyn, LIC, and other places which address very specifically the issues that the uh, chair just spoke of and um, displacement, uh, lack of infrastructure because of how things were done. And, and very specifically, um, communities like downtown Brooklyn where you kind of plan for 900 units of housing and you end up with 
15, 20,000 units at, at differently, or um, what, what, what uh, did that address the infrastructure needs? And, and somewhere like Long Island City, where the same thing took place, where there was no transportation, no libraries, no schools, and then after the fact, we have to come in and try to address some of these municipal services. And so the question that was asked then was, um, by what metrics do you claim success if, in fact, these things did occur? And as we move forward, we would like to know uh, what plan, what rezonings do you have in the future throughout the city? And do we plan on using the same metrics uh, to, to, to address those rezonings? And then my final question would be, uh, once again, uh, about the diversity of the staff, particularly amongst the planners. Thank you for all those questions. Um, I'll start by reiterating that an EIS is not a crystal ball. It is not a predictive document. It's a disclosure document to inform the decision makers, um, including the City Planning Commission and the Council. I believe that downtown Brooklyn is an absolute success, and I say that as a Brooklynite. At the start of the rezoning, there were 1,000 housing units total in downtown Brooklyn. Today, we have 2,000 permanently affordable units. Um, when the downtown Brooklyn rezoning was undertaken, it was with the expectation that it would become a back office market, a lower cost alternative to Manhattan central business districts. Following the rezoning, um, I had mentioned that global trends affect how the city develops. Following the rezoning, there was the 2007 and 2008 recession. We were fortunate in New York that we recovered from it more quickly than most of the rest of the country. But that recession basically froze up the need, the demand for more office space. Fortunately, the rezoning was comprehensive and flexible enough to allow for the creation of housing. Housing in a neighborhood that is as transit rich as can possibly be, sitting aside, astride so many subway lines, Long Island Railroad Station, and countless bus lines as well. And so we have seen an extraordinarily virtuous cycle. Um, one key part of the success of downtown Brooklyn are the academic institutions that are there. It is not widely known that in downtown Brooklyn, we have more students in higher education than the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which most people would think of as an education mecca. The combination of the students and the workforce has now attracted employers. We very much welcome this because any resident who walks, who bicycles, who skateboards to walk to work in downtown Brooklyn is one less person that is not getting onto the subway system commuting into Manhattan. And so it actually relieves pressures in that way. I would be very glad to share with the council a lengthy and detailed memo, um, or a letter, I should say, um, that outlines in great depth why we believe that downtown Brooklyn is an example of a very wise rezoning that has benefited our city. So I'm, I'm sorry, because that was almost the same answers that it was just given. Um, but we know that somewhere like downtown Brooklyn, particularly around the Clinton Hill, Fort Greene area, was probably in the area of about 68% uh, African American leading into prior to the rezoning and is, is less than 25% now. So, but just based on that metric, and I, and I do understand that you created this and as was testified last year, an entirely new economy, but there's also a dynamic where you have to provide resources for the thousands of people that were, was displaced. Where are they now? And what services are being provided? What additional municipal, ser municipal services have to happen, including in Long Island City? So we put the cart before the horse, and now we find ourselves now with no transportation, no education, no libraries, and schools, as well as health care. But now we end up 
when we have a cost neutral budget taken from somewhere else to make sure that these now emerging communities have these type of municipal services. If in fact this is a um, design that you agree to swear by, do we next, the, the next rezoning, are there gonna be of the same model? Can we expect the same thing and, and, and where would they be located in the city? Thank you, Council Member, for noting that rezonings are one part of the way we address the needs of a growing city. The other is through the annual capital and expense budget, which is how the city delivers services to communities across the city. I'm actually very pleased that we have taken the process of the community district statement of needs, which used to be such a cumbersome paper-based process, and have streamlined it in a way that allows community districts much more critically to identify their top needs, and that is very helpful to the city's capital planning agencies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Councilman Miller. I um, want to recognize we've been joined by Councilmember uh, Trey Green Gibson. And next up for questioning is Councilmember Barron. Thank you to the chair for the uh, hearing and thank you to the panel for coming. We're talking about applications for development of projects uh, and going through the ULIP process. What where does the community land trust concept and organizations fit into this plan for development? It's good to see you again, council member. It was just last week that we were out in East New York with those absolutely incredible fifth graders um, who yes. provided us input on the comprehensive waterfront yes. plan. Um, with respect to questions about community land trusts and that form of ownership, I would defer those to HPD. Do you have any projects that have come before you from uh, community land trusts? I'm aware of projects that have come before us with neighborhood-based nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I will have to get back to you with respect to community land trusts. Okay, thank you. And I just want to say that uh, when the plans for the East New York rezoning began in about 1998 or thereabouts, the federal government issued a document talking about what the objective was for the redevelopment of that area. And they very definitively, clearly stated that gentrification is a byproduct of the development of these transit-rich zones. I have to go back and find that document, but it was unequivocal that that's what happens. So joining my comments with those of my colleagues who've talked about that, we know that that is a byproduct, that is a, uh, a product of what we get when we have projects that are so-called affordable, but yet are nowhere near the existing AMIs of the community in which these projects are being brought. So for example, in East New York, the neighborhood median income is about $36,000. So for me, it doesn't make sense to say that a project is affordable and it's bringing in housing at a percentages of 25% at 100% AMI or 120% AMI, because that's not what exists in my community, which is about 90% black and Latino. Thank you, Council Member. I'm not aware of the federal government document. I would, I would welcome seeing it. I'll look it. for it, because I remember <laughs> reading it about uh, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, and I'll look for it and try to refer it to you. I would actually, I'm glad that you mentioned the East New York, uh, because that is the first of the neighborhood rezonings mm -hmm. um, that was adopted and that mapped MIH. And it's been a number of years. As I mentioned, rezonings play themselves out over 5, 10, 15 years. Right. But what we are already seeing in East, in East New York is encouraging because the rezoning was part of a comprehensive neighborhood plan. Um, we have already seen so the investment. So you're saying it's encouraging. I'm talking particularly about the change in the ethnic composition 
if I could note, um, it is encouraging because we have already seen market enhancements to City Line Park. We have seen the old surrogates court building, which had first been underutilized and then closed for years, come back to life as a police youth activity center that is a beehive of activity. Um, we are seeing the construction of affordable housing and the neighborhood is not one that supports um, housing construction without subsidy. And so we are seeing significant housing construction on the Chestnut Dinsmore site and also the construction of a school. These are all as a result of the East New York Neighborhood Plan. And so it is good to see this level of investment in a community that had been ignored for too long. It certainly had been, but my point again comes to the East New York Rezoning Plan at the outset said 50% of the units that come in will be market rate. That was a given at the beginning. And of the remaining 50% of the units, it turns out that about 20% of them match the income of the community. So it does result in displacement, and I will look for that uh, document and share that with you. And in terms of your staff, where can we find the diversity numbers that talk about the demographics of your staff? No, certainly. Um, I can give you a top line number, which is that the department in FY17 was 63% white this past year, it was 56%. It is changing. I think though we always know that we need to redouble our efforts. Um, among the initiatives that we have launched at the department are having paid internships. So that internships, that opportunity to get your foot in the door are not reserved only for those who can afford, to, for students who can afford to work for free. And with the rollout of the paid internships, the diversity of our intern, intern pool has increased markedly. And thank you, uh, you've indicated a decrease in the white staffing. What has been the increase in the black staffing? I'll be glad to get that for you. Thank That's you. the only number that I have at hand right now. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairs. Thank you, thank you, Council Member. Uh, next up, we have uh, Council Member uh, Levin, followed by Council Member Deutsch, followed by Council Member Traeger. Thank you very much, Chair. Hi, Chair, how are you? Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, so last November, the Department of City Planning uh, presented an analysis uh, to the community in my district of the Waynesburg Greenpoint rezoning of 2005, um, which showed that some of the basic um, assumptions of the, of the EIS at the time um, did, not, did not bear out. So the number of units, overall units, uh, uh, proceeded much more quickly than, and this is, keep in mind, through the financial crisis. Um, so there was about three years or four years where nothing at all was built, um, but, but there have been 17,000 units that were built or in the pipeline, which is more than double uh, the FEIS projection. Um, and then on top of that, we've seen a, um, you know, the average uh, for affordable housing is, ends up significantly lower than 20%, which is what the um, goal was at the time. Now, obviously, the 2005 rezoning predates um, your tenure. Um, and, but my, my question is, um, is DCP looking at doing such an analysis for other large-scale rezonings um, that it's undertaken in the last 10, 15 years, and, um, and then what do we do about it when it's not, when, when a rezoning does not end up living up to um, the anticipated benefit, um, you know, what do we do about it after the fact, 15 years later, um, and a community sees all the impact? I mean, it's, you know, in, in the neighborhoods of Williamsburg Greenpoint, I live in Greenpoint, and uh, as you said, gentrification is a multi, uh, multi-headed hydra. It's you know, it's not, it's not, um, 
there's no single reason uh, for gentrification, but uh, we certainly have seen uh, the impact um, in very stark terms in a neighborhood like Greenpoint where um, the number of uh, evictions of senior citizens um, is pretty staggering. Um, the amount of um, rent stabilized housing that's, that's come down, um, uh, tenants that were forced out through um, harassment, uh, which is well documented, um, owners seeking to get out of rent stabilized uh, uh, regulation. Um, and so what do we do when 15 years later it's, it, we see how um, a rezoning may have exacerbated the problem? Thank you for a multi-headed hydra of a question, which I'll try to uh, unpack the answer. Um, you so eloquently noted the number <clears throat> of non-land use measures that are needed to address the issue of displacement and fear of displacement. One, one thing I just might add really quickly is that when this administration uh, allocated um, uh, uh, legal services dollars for housing court, um, this was not a neighborhood that received those resources <laughs> because it was a prior rezoning. And in some sense, it, it gave the, the message to, to, that, to the community was, you guys are too far gone. Um, which is not the case. There are still people that need representation in the neighborhood. So anyway, can you no, continue? And certainly, you mentioned the change in rent stabilization laws, which will have a very significant impact. Hopefully. My point is that we need to look at the full panoply of tools. Um, I think the other thing that you had mentioned, that you mentioned that is very much worth putting, uh, uh, highlighting, is the difference between a voluntary inclusionary housing approach and mandatory inclusionary housing. Mm -hmm. And so that is part of how we learn. You don't find us now mapping voluntary inclusionary housing. MIH is the law of the land. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly believe that it is an improvement. Yeah. Um, is there any um, uh, interest on the part of DCP to, to examine um, re other rezonings of the same in the same method. Sorry, I forgot that part okay. of your of your hydra. No um, the look that we did at your request and the request of the community board was tremendously helpful for us, and it was um, at a point in time where enough time had lapsed from the rezoning to be able mm -hmm. to begin to see trends. Um, within one year, two year, five years, it is very early days. Yeah. Here we had a 15 year track record. Mm -hmm. We found it very useful and I can well imagine us looking at other neighborhoods in the same way. Th okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. We have to move on because um, we're running out of time and we have Do It, who's next. So um, uh, next up we have uh, Councilmember Deutsch, followed by Traeger, followed by Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, while I appreciate all the work that city planning does to plan uh, our future, um, I have a, my question is, is that in the city of New York, we have approximately 100 land lease buildings and where many or some of them have an expiration date of 20 to 30 years. Uh, usually the lease is between 50 and 99 years. And uh, one of the fears that many have is that they could face eviction. Uh, and it's also very difficult for the, uh, the condo or co-op owners because they, can't e they cannot even go for any type of refinance since uh, usually it's done uh, as a 30-year um, mortgage and many people have difficult times making ends meet, cannot even do any type of refinance. So what conversations uh, does city planning, uh, uh, what, what conversations is city planning um, in, in regards to the land lease? and the future of these thousands of tenants who might be homeless? I'm aware of land leases uh, from very personal experience. I went to Cooper Union and the school is financed by owning the land um, on which the Chrysler Building sits. It is leased land. I'm not aware of the issue with respect to the home ownership units 
what I can do is follow up with the Department of Finance, which I believe would probably be the correct city agency to look at this. Okay, so I'd like to know, because I have, I have several buildings, I have a few buildings in my district that are on, under this um, uh, current uh, land, le land lease uh, obligations. So I wanted to see if we could get the rights agencies involved uh, and see if we could set up a meeting, offline meeting. Yeah, we will be glad. We'll reach out to your office to find out what are the particular buildings are and then also to see if we can assemble the right agencies. Great, thank you so much. Councilman Traeger. Thank you to the chairs. Um, I just want to bring uh, to the attention of DCP uh, something that is very pressing and I would say it has reached a crisis level in my district. Uh, a district that DCP did quite a work in, particularly in the last administration, but still moving into this administration. We're now 10 years past, over 10 years past, the uh, infamous Coney Island 2009 rezoning. And I was still a public school teacher at the time, but I remember uh, receiving a lot of information, seeing presentations on the glitzy and glamorous uh, portraits of what Coney Island was going to be five to ten years from then, from 2009. We're now at the year 2020. I want to tell DCP that we're down to one bank, one bank that serves over 50,000 people. We have a double than average small business vacancy rate. Um, we have a commercial retail crisis. And the response that I've received so far from the administration has been, well, don't worry, Councilman Traeger, the 2009 rezoning made way to build housing in the future. That is insulting to the people who live in my district today. The answer cannot be, wait for the housing that will be built 5 to 10 to 15 years from now. It is insulting to tell my constituents that they have to travel to a different zip code to conduct basic banking services. And again, this was presentations handled by city planning, EDC, and a plethora of other agencies. I'd like to hear the response from city planning. Thank you for raising these issues. What I would love to do is to be able to follow up with you. And the issues that you raise strike me as perhaps benefiting from the involvement of our Department of Small Business Services. What is interesting is that in some neighborhoods, we hear concerns about too many bank branches, but I think you raise, if anything, a bigger challenge, which is underbanking and the absence of those resources. Respectfully, the, the reason why I'm bringing this to the attention of DCP is because it was your agency and others that sold my community a bag of goods about the 2009 rezoning. And I also want to say it was city planning that somehow allowed operators and the administration to utilize significant lots of public land. Think about the amusement district, think about the amphitheater, think about MCU Park, the baseball stadium that is on prime land that only operates three to four months of the year. And one of the reasons why businesses are afraid to come into Coney Island is because they can't survive with foot traffic only three months of the year. But somebody gave them permission to basically utilize the land only three, four months of the year. So we have all of this massive public land in prime locations only activated during the warm seasonal months. And that's why a small mom and pop shop have, has difficulty to, to, to survive. So city planning is very much involved in this, as well as, well as EDC and parks and, and other agencies. I was not at all suggesting, council member, yeah. that we are not involved. As I had mentioned, rezonings play themselves out over years, and you're quite right that market conditions in Coney Island have not produced very significant. Michael amount. Bloomberg failed Coney Island. And but we I, we need to address the crisis that my folks are feel that my constituents are experiencing right now, and that that is actually why I don't think that the answer is to say wait for the housing. Thank you. Putting in place an as of right rezoning that will allow for housing is one part of the solution. But I would welcome reaching out to you with thank you. the Department of Small Business Services. All right. Thank you. Thank you, chairs.
Thank you, Councilman Reynoso. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Chair, and for everyone being here today. Just um, wanted a, a couple of questions. Um, DCP put out a report related to uh, DCP put out a report related to the uh, units being developed in the city of New York in certain neighborhoods. Um, and one of those neighborhoods that they saw a significant amount of increase in development was Bushwick. Uh, Bushwick, before even the, the conversation about the rezoning, saw 6,000 units of housing growth um, in only a couple of years. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing communities in the city of New York. Uh, when the Bushwick community came together alongside DCP in an attempt to rezone it, uh, the city of New York said, quote unquote, it wasn't worth it to pursue it because it didn't produce enough affordable housing. Uh, the current status quo and R6 rezoning in mostly black and brown neighborhoods like Flatbush and Will M. Bushwick are examples, and Brownsville are three examples of R6 um, zoning from like the 1960s. Uh, if kept the same, we will continue to build housing that is not affordable. In the, for example, in Bushwick, these 6,000 units. We have went through a plan in the Bushwick rezoning to allow to move a lot of this housing to what we consider appropriate areas and under city uh, parameters that are considered uh, transportation hubs, moving density into areas that have, uh, are within a quarter mile of a, of a transportation hub just really feels like we've hit all the marks on the head and at this moment are already producing market rate housing. Um, <clears throat> uh, wanted to know if this conversation about 5,000 additional housing units with a rezoning was really the fight that DCP had to a, had a draw a line on the sand, not on the sand, had to draw a line to, to not develop in Bushwick. Thank you for your question, council member, and with apologies to the other members, I'll, because we did address this earlier, I'll go back through it. I want to thank you for highlighting a few things. One is that displacement occurs with or without, we are seeing displacement occurring with or without rezoning. As you noted, years before there was a discussion of a rezoning in Bushwick, we saw the production of these 6,000 plus units overwhelmingly market rate units. Um, that's why it's so important to recognize in addressing displacement, fear of displacement, that we deploy tools, land use, but also beyond land use, many of the tenant protection and anti-harassment measures. Um, with respect, the other thing I, had, I want to thank you for is for the work of you, Council Member Espinal, the community board, and countless community leaders and organizations in getting this very rich, fine-grained understanding of Bushwick, of where there were opportunities, in particular along the wide avenues that have two different subway lines, that's a treasure, um, and also of mid-blocks that had a very different character from the wider avenues. Um, as you note, and as Deputy Mayor Bean noted in her letter to you, the Bushwick Community Plan. And I'm we so believe, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. I only have a minute and 30, and I want to go back and forth a little bit. So, if like, gladly. just just at the core of this question is, um, what do we have in, in a planning proposal that, which I think we could both agree on, the 1960s um, rezoning is a problem. The current status quo is, is uh, producing only market rate housing. Why is a plan by which we were to be able to create 2,000 units of housing and move the current development into transit hubs and wider streets, why is that not a good conversation to have between a community and the administration? Why is this solely that the only out is um, development above all? Not development above all, development where appropriate, and the densities that were proposed for the upzoned areas, the areas proposed to be upzoned in the Bushwick community plan, we think were too low. It was in essence an overall neighborhood downzoning. That is, that other, is just not, other, by, even by your standards, that it wouldn't be considered uh, downzoning. We're talking about um, right sizing the R6 area and the R6 area along uh, Broadway, Myrtle, Wyckoff, and Wilson, and Knickerbocker would all see an increase, and we'll see a production of 8,000 units of housing, of which 2,000 would be affordable. So that would, in, in by no means, would be considered a downzoning. If that's the narrative that you want to play, I think it 
it kind of speaks to this inability for DCP to work with a community and come to a place where, that is considered a compromise where everyone feels like they lost a little bit, but we made the city better. The, the current conversations in the Bronx and in other areas of the city are gonna continue to happen and it's almost like you're okay. You're buying time till we get out of office, so maybe you can have negotiations with the future council members, but at this point, it just doesn't seem like you're playing, you're, you're playing uh, a fair game with the community and asking them to engage in, in, a, in a system where the outcomes are only what you want and nothing else. There has been a back and forth dialogue, as you know, council member, over the past few years. Um, I do have to note that the number of projected housing units we do not believe is realistic. Sites that have been identified in the community plan as soft sites include an active post office. They include a building with 60 residential units. We do not believe that it is reasonable to assume that these are sites that would be able to be developed for affordable housing. Okay, we'll have uh, further conversations, with our, which I would love to, but I also wanna know, um, I just wanna make sure we also get the amount of money spent by DCP over the last five years to get to this point with Bushwick, um, because at this point it's a, it's a wasted money. So I wanna know how much money was spent um, in consultants and the work that has been doing by the staff, so we could just put it into perspective on whether or not we're spending our time wisely when it comes to DCP and these rezonings. And council member, if I might pick up on a comment that you made, um, again, a comment that I had made earlier with respect to Southern Boulevard, I do not believe that time spent on solid planning and understanding a neighborhood is wasted time. We have in the neighborhood plan, in the Bushwick community plan, documents that pull together thoughts about the future. Even if there is no rezoning, it sets a framework for the future should private applications come forward. Here is a document that memorializes the thinking. Yeah, we, we know this administration is not too keen on outcomes, but in communities, we are. We care about outcomes. And while you have all this information, my community continues to get displaced, and my community continues to give you units of market rate housing with no affordability. So I'm glad that you have uh, paper and content and data that you can give to private developers when they want to move forward, but this community is now going to suffer and be relegated to outdated um, land use and zoning uh, um, work. So again, I want to thank the, the chair for Council indulging member, me and giving me all not, this time. It but, is not uh, information for developers. It is information yeah. for the community boards, community members, and the council members as they evaluate any private applications. Yeah. That when Bushwick is 50% white and no longer has any Latino or black families or no more poor families and the um, average income goes from 38,000 to 64,000, we would love to have a conversation about the data that you have um, when, we no longer, when I no longer represent a majority minority neighborhood. So continue the, the tale of two cities and the displacement of families that are happening. I just don't see the urgency coming from this administration. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, very well said. Um, Chair, um, just uh, my last few questions. How many units have been created under the Mayor's housing plan as of date? I'll get back to you after consulting with HPD. Okay. Um, considering how many units are tied up within the, finan the financing pipeline, is the Mayor's housing plan on track to reach the 300,000 units? As Deputy Mayor Bean recently um, commented, we are on track. With respect to any issues about the financing pipeline, I would refer you to HPD. Okay. Does the city planning weigh in on when housing projects close as part of the city's pipeline? That's an HPD determination. So there's no, uh, city planning has no recommendations, no, no decision making at all? No, our as role is to process discretionary land use applications, including for the production of housing. Last year, following the passage of a tax amendment restricting enclosed mechanical voids, DCP agreed to study unenclosed mechanical voids in residential buildings. What is the status of the study on unenclosed mechanical voids? We had agreed to report the results of the, su of the study this summer, and we'll do so. And then finally, uh, let's talk a little bit about the borough-based jails. Uh, can you give us uh, an update on um, where, where are we? I would defer to DDC, the Department of Design and Construction, which together with MACJ is taking the lead on this. All right. 
With that, do I have any colleagues that uh, wish to ask any questions? No? Seeing none, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Richards. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Chairs. Uh, quick question, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman, for all of the great work that uh, we've certainly accomplished in the Rockaways, and I think things are really moving um, in a way that most people are speaking of today, true affordability, infrastructure investment, um, all of the things that matter to communities. One of the uh, questions I had, and although Rockaway is, is certainly a template of where we should go, um, is in the other rezonings. You know, how are we tying, I, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more of how HPD is truly working hand in hand with you to alleviate a lot of these fears because the big problem is, as, as we heard from most of my colleagues, is that subsidy has to be there, especially when you're talking about neighborhood rezoning. So I'm interested in hearing just a little bit more about how closely HPD is working with you. And then on all the other things that matter to communities, healthcare investment, um, school seats, which is a big one, um, in light of uh, more density coming into neighborhoods, you know, how are we strategically working with the other agencies in a comprehensive manner around Queens, um, specifically on uh, these rezonings? Thank you, Council Member. And it actually is a treat to be in a room with Council Members representing a third of the neighborhood rezonings that we have between you and Council Member Gibson. Um, and you quite properly point out that in a neighborhood plan, it's not just about the zoning. The zoning may be the controversial piece, but when we are invited in to a community by the community board, by the council member, to take a comprehensive look, we bring along lots of friends. And those friends include HPD, Department of Transportation, School Construction Authority, DEP, sort of the major capital agencies, but they also involve health and mental hygiene. They involve small business services with their Workforce One centers. And so the, the look that we take at a community, with a community, is a holistic one that identifies the needs. Many of the needs have nothing to do with land use, but are absolutely essential. I would note in particular with respect to downtown Far Rockaway, the fact that a new library is under construction is already one manifestation of the planning and the responsiveness to the neighborhood's call. I think the second is we usually talk about building. The fact that as a result of the downtown Far Rockaway rezoning, we were able to tear down a embarrassment of a shopping mall to pave the way for future housing is a, yet again another manifestation of the good community-informed planning work that we do. And, um, and I know I've heard a lot of concerns, and I don't know if H&H &H is at the table um, in a lot of these conversations, Health and Hospitals Corporation, but certainly the stress on health care has been tremendous, even for a downtown Jamaica, a Jamaica hospital. And I know a lot of times we like to shy away from hospitals such as Jamaica, who may not be in the H&H system, but we need to ensure that um, the administration is certainly paying a lot more attention, uh, Elmhurst Hospital, all of these different locations where we're seeing a lot more um, population increases, Long Island City. So just more of a holistic look at that. And then I noticed in the budget, um, uh, the November 2019 plan includes federal community development block grants, um, funding of 1.2 million in fiscal, uh, for funding of 1.2 million, and then in fiscal year 2020, uh, another $1.7 million for the Edgemere rezoning. Can you just speak specifically? I'm very happy that more money is coming to my district, uh, but just want to hear a little bit more about. Uh, what's Gladly. The if I could there. pick up on your comment about health and hospitals, I've had the good fortune to discuss with Dr. Mitchell Katz, the, um, the head of it, that he thinks very holistically about his institutions and also recognizes that they have something that is increasingly a uh, tight commodity in New York, which is land. And so I think we have in him a forward-looking head of H&H &H that will think not just about the four corners of the hospital, the H&H &H buildings. 
Um, with respect to resilient Edgemere, this is an HPD initiative um, that we are pleased to be working with HPD on. HPD has taken a look at the neighborhood and recognized, one, it is one of the areas in the city where HPD still has a number of city-owned lots, but they are challenging lots to develop. They are small, inter widely dispersed lots. In looking at the neighborhood, HPD recognized that the lots closest to Jamaica Bay were the ones that were most inundated both by Sandy, but also by full moon tidal flooding. And that those are areas that are at special coastal risk and where development should be very sharply curtailed. We have done this in a number of other neighborhoods throughout the city with the strongest support from the neighborhoods and the council members. At the same time, HPD realized that along Rockaway Beach Boulevard, along the A train, that is both the high point of the peninsula and the area most accessible to mass transit. And in much the same way that we saw with the Peninsula Hospital site that the development was able to build in a resilient fashion so close to public transportation, HPD believes that there are opportunities for a modest upzoning along Rockaway Beach Boulevard. They asked, HPD reached out to us and indicated that it would facilitate and accelerate their work if they would be able to make use of our existing environmental consulting contracts. So while they will be in charge of the work, they put the money into our budget to be able to take advantage of these contracts. I look forward to working with you on these and once again want to thank you for the work we've accomplished here and we've got a long way to go for the entire city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you, Chair, uh, for this dialogue. Um, and uh, we will be in recess, uh, do it, we'll be up next, thank you.
All right, good afternoon. My name is uh, Councilman Rafael Salamanca, and I'm the chair of the Council's Committee on Land Use. This hearing will cover the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Because there are significant technology issues pertaining to the city's franchise agreements with cable and telecommunication companies, this is a joint hearing with the Committee on Land Use and the Committee on Technology. I am honored to co-chair today's budgetary hearing with my colleague, Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. DOIT provides citywide coordination and technical expertise in the development and use of data, voice, and video technologies in the city services and operations. They also provide infrastructure support for data processing and communication services to numerous city agencies, researches and manages IT projects, and administers the city's cable television, public paid telephones, and mobile and high capacity telecommunication franchise agreements. During today's hearing, we would like to review many aspects of the department's fiscal 2021 pre preliminary budget, as well as other issues related to the department's operations and organization. In particular, I would like to get status updates on franchise agreements with the city's major telecommunication companies, as well as the agreements with City Bridge for the continued expansion of Link NYC kiosks. Additionally, last year we spoke about the dispute between the city and charter communications, so we would like an update on the resolution of that matter. We must ensure that DOIT's vendors are meeting their deliverables on time and that major telecommunication companies are in compliance with their franchise agreements. Furthermore, I am interested in further examining the department's organizational structure. Specifically, I would like to gain a better understanding of the operational relationship between DOIT and the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and why it makes sense for MOME to be under the DOIT umbrella. With an operating budget of over $695 million and hundreds of millions more in capital investments, it is critical that we thoroughly examine DOIT's financial plan, its planned pro projects and operational challenges to ensure that we are optimizing our return on this substantial investment. We hope that today's hearing will con contribute to our efforts in finding ways to use technology to make government more efficient and productive. We look forward to working with DOIT towards meeting this goal. I would like to thank DOIT Commissioner Jessica Tisch and her staff for joining us today. Now I will pass it along to my uh, co-chair, uh, Council Member Holden. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget hearing for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, known as DOIT. I am Council Member Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. I am pleased to be to join the Committee on Land Use, chaired by Council Member Rafael Salamanca. The Department of Informational Technology and Telecommunications Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget totals $695.2 million, including $1.813 million for personal services to support 1,891 full-time employees. These resources are spread across six programs that include Cyber Command, 911 Emergency Call Center IT Support, 311NYC.gov Operations, Mayor's Office for Media and Entertainment, Citywide Tech Services, and Do It Administrative and Operations. Additionally, Do It's preliminary commitment plan totals five, uh, $523.5 million in fiscal 2020 to 2024 and provides for the upgrades for several major citywide uh, technology systems, including both 911 public safety answering centers. At today's hearing, we will examine, examine the budget and operational performance of each of the program areas, as well as other major components of the department's budget, including its contract budget that is projected to be $234.7 million, uh, new needs and budget savings initiatives proposed in the financial plan, revenues gen generated through franchise agreements and other city fees, and major IT infrastructure investments. We would also like to discuss staffing levels at the department and whether the city is providing competitive salaries, which is an important uh, factor, so that we can attract the talent necessary 
to make New York City one of the most uh, advanced cities in the country. City investments in technology should provide long-term benefits with the goal of making municipal government more productive, efficient, and accessible to New Yorkers. Uh, we look forward to working with DOIT toward achieving that goal. I would like to welcome DOIT's Commissioner Jessica Tisch uh, and her team. After the testimony, members will have the opportunity to follow up with questions for the Commissioner. After that, I hope that the Commissioner and staff remain to listen to the public testify. Uh, in closing, I would like to thank the committee staff for working and putting this hearing together, including Florentine Kabor, uh, Sebastian Baki, uh, and Irene Bajowski, Charles Kim, and my chief of staff, Daniel Krasina. Uh, I'll now ask uh, the committee counsel to, to please swear in the commissioner. With, um, with the commissioner is uh, Michael Pastor and John Winkler. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth and answer honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin, Commissioner. Just if you can just turn on the mic. Yeah, just. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Salamanca and Holden and members of the City Council Committee on Land Use and Technology. My name is Jessica Tisch, and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT, and New York City's Chief Information Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DOIT's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget. With me is John Winker, Associate Commissioner of Financial Services, and Michael Pastor, our agency's general counsel. I've been working for the city for 11 years, and for me, watching live streams of agency budget hearings has become like sport. I am so honored to be here, leading an agency, testifying in front of the council, and answering your questions. And I am humbled to be joined today by a group of people who have made it their lives work to advocate for vulnerable New Yorkers. I am speaking in particular about representatives of the deaf, hard of hearing, and survivors of domestic violence communities who I have had the pleasure of getting to know and work arm in arm with over the past three months on the Text to 911 program. Nicolin Plummer, Dennis Martinez, thank you for your patience, your guidance, and your partnership. I would also like to thank Deputy Inspector Craig Edelman, the Executive Officer of the NYPD's Communications Division, as well as Captain Michael Tracy from the Fire Department for being here. Your presence at this hearing is an important symbol of our agency's close partnership on all things 911. I have a bold vision for the future of technology in New York City, and I am working on a plan to modernize the city's technology infrastructure which I look forward to briefing you on in full during the executive budget. This is exactly what I did for a single, albeit very large, agency over six years as CIO of the NYPD. And I am certain that it is exactly what is needed across city government today. My way of saying, this is what I do. Over the past few months, we have made significant progress on a number of fronts, and I thought I might use this opportunity to highlight some projects that I know are of interest to the Council. Let's start with some good news, and on a program that many of you know is near and dear to my heart. I am pleased to report that it is looking like Text to 911 will go live by June, so we will meet our commitment made at last November's oversight hearing to the Council. And that is because Text to 911 is now technology ready and training is underway. As part of testing, we intentionally flooded the system and it performed up to our high public safety standards. We have also worked very closely with Cyber Command on robust cyber testing of the system. As you know, this text to 911 system will be an interim solution designed to bridge the gap between where we are today with an entirely legacy analog 911 system and where we will be in 2024 when we roll out NextGen 911. The purpose of NextGen 911 is to allow voice, photos, videos, and text messages 
to flow seamlessly from the public to 911 on modern digital infrastructure. Make no mistake about it, NextGen 911 has the potential to be, hands down, the most impactful new public safety system in the city of New York over the next decade. As a woman who has public safety IT running through her veins, I can tell you it is absolutely imperative that we get it right. So what progress have we made? Just last month, we selected vendors and completed contract negotiations for three key systems that are fundamental to the development of NextGen 911. We selected Vesta solutions to build out the core back end and geographical information systems, and NICE Systems Inc. to build out the new logging and recording system. These decisions were based on a rigorous vendor selection process that involved an evaluation committee with representatives from Do It, NYPD, and FDNY with advice and guidance from Cyber Command. The evaluation committee traveled to call centers to review products and gather firsthand customer feedback, and to vendor labs across the country for live demonstrations of next-gen technologies and briefings on each proposer's approach to factory staging and implementation. Our selection balanced the equities of price, performance, and technical capability. And yes, the contracts that we negotiated have exhaustive protections in place to ensure that vendors we pay with city tax dollars deliver on time and on budget. As for timeline, selecting vendors and completing contract negotiations by the end of January was key to getting NextGen 911 on track to be fully implemented in 2020, 2024. Moving on from 911, but staying in the telephony space, I'd like to discuss 5G, which is one of the things I pledged to fix when I took this position three months ago. I am committed to working with the carriers and our agency partners to kickstart the 5G build out across the city and to do so equitably and safely. To that end, just weeks ago, DOIT awarded 12 new mobile telecommunications franchises to companies for the deployment of infrastructure to support the densification of 4G LTE and ultimately the build out of 5G. The franchises enable the use of city light poles and for the first time street furniture for the deployment of wireless facilities. With these new franchises in place, I am proud to announce that we will be opening a new poll reservation phase in the coming months, during which franchisees will be permitted to reserve polls throughout the five boroughs for 5G rollout and 4G densification. Details of this reservation phase are being hammered out now, but I am confident that its scope and safeguards will underscore our commitment to aggressively build out this highway for the future and to do so equitably in a way that ensures that carriers build their networks in neighborhoods beyond Midtown Manhattan, bringing 5G to all New Yorkers. Unfortunately, federal and state forces are trying to dismantle our franchise model, a key jet revenue generator for the city, in lieu of an approach that claims to streamline and accelerate the expansion of 5G. It will not and it will come at the expense of public safety. For context, for 5G to work, carriers need to put equipment on New York City's poles and other infrastructure. This equipment is larger than the equipment required for 4G. We cannot risk harm to New Yorkers through the unfettered proliferation of suspended refrigerators on poles not built to support them. It is our responsibility to protect New York City's local control of its streetscape and this important revenue stream. Finally, I wanted to give you an update on two additional topics before I move on to the budget. Since last year's executive budget hearing, we launched a new platform for the 311 system. This was a long overdue overhaul to the legacy 311 system that had been in place since the program's inception nearly 20 years ago. Since launch, we have continued to make enhancements, including, notably, 
implementing Local Law 8 of 2020, the legislation that requires a city to post monthly complaints of illegal parking of vehicles operated on behalf of the city, and requires 311 to accept pictures of suspected illegal parking of vehicles with placards. I am aware that there are many ways we can improve even the most basic of functions, and I look to the council members and your constituents as core users of 311 to continue to give us helpful feedback. As Chair Holden, you and Council Member Cabrera did in your letter from February, which is becoming an important part of the platform's roadmap. We are also full steam ahead on decommissioning 911, uh, excuse me, on decommissioning NICEWIN. I am pleased to report that NYPD, DCAS, DOHMH, Parks, FISA, and DOB have already completely migrated to commercial carriers, and DOT, Disney, and DEP should be fully migrated by the committed deadline of June 2020. Once all the agencies are off the network, we will begin the work of closing out the Northrop Grumman contract by removing the nice one infrastructure from rooftops and restoring facilities leased for this purpose. In the interest of time, I will now take the committees through the FY21 budget as it stands today. Do its fiscal 2021 preliminary budget provides for operating expenses of approximately $695.3 million, allocating $181.3 million in personnel services to support 1,891 full-time positions and $514 million for other than personnel services, or OTPS. Intracity funds transferred from other agencies account for $141.5 million, or about 20% of our total budget allocation. Telecommunications costs represent the largest portion of the intracity expense, projected at $106 million for fiscal year 2020. For fiscal year 2020, the expense budget appro appropriation increased by $2.5 million from the fiscal year 2021 November financial plan to the preliminary financial plan. The increase to the fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget is largely attributed to the intracity funding transfers from agencies that have been re reflected in the January financial plan. For fiscal year 2021, the expense budget appropriation decreased by $2.2 million from the fiscal year 2021 November financial plan to the preliminary financial plan. The decrease to the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget is largely attributed to the savings initiatives that we have implemented through IT hardware decommissioning and the discontinuation of software licenses, subscriptions, and support services. Finally, council members, before taking your questions, I'd like to address head on an issue that I know is of concern to many of you and certainly is to me. That is the general downward trend of DeWitt's franchise revenues. For FY19, these revenues, projected at approximately 186 million, came in at $156 million. There are several reasons for this. Notably, cable revenue has suffered because of shifting consumer practices and cord cutting. But make no mistake about it. The largest source of this revenue hit is not a change in consumer preferences, which government couldn't and shouldn't affect. It's something that we, as stewards of New York City's franchises, can fix, and that is City Bridge's failure to pay the city what it owes us under the terms of their agreement to provide free Wi-Fi and telephony services through Link NYC kiosks. The breach I am describing goes beyond money owed to the City of New York. CityBridge has also failed to install and activate new link structures and remove old payphones. One source of good news. In my short time here, I have worked with CityBridge to get the payphone removal portion of the franchise agreement moving again and already authorized the removal of hundreds of public payphones, which many of your offices have been bringing to our attention. But on the links, we have not gotten City Bridge to make any progress. Installation of new links stopped in fall of 2018. Troublingly, a large majority of the 537 links 
owe to the city are in underserved areas in boroughs other than Manhattan. New Yorkers who would benefit most from this service are not getting it, including thousands of people who live in districts that many of you represent because City Bridge is delinquent. By way of background, City Bridge is a consortium of companies, one of which is a subsidiary of Alphabet, the parent company of Google. City Bridge owes the city tens of millions of dollars going back to FY19. All of this is against the backdrop of millions of dollars in advertising revenue that City Bridge has reported they received over the same time period. But for me, the most shocking part is that the city has actually gone out of its way over a number of years to work with the franchisee to address a number of burdens that it said were affecting its ability to perform. For example, as recently as June of 2018, Do It amended City Bridge's franchise agreement to provide more time to complete the build out of the links and even to defer some of the revenue-based franchise compensation potentially owed to the city to later years. At the time of this renegotiation, City Bridge told Do It and testified publicly at the FCRC that with the relief granted by the amendment to the franchise agreement, City Bridge would be on sound financial footing and fully capable of performing all remaining obligations under the agreement. Just three months later, in September of 2018, Do It went as far as to grant City Bridge forbearance from payments for a period of one year. The city has been more than a reasonable partner, working with City Bridge to help it fulfill its obligations to New Yorkers. So let me be absolutely clear so there is zero ambiguity here. The city's expectation remains that City Bridge will pay the city what it is contractually obligated to pay. I am here today to commit to you that as the new commissioner of Do It, I am poised to take any and all necessary action against these multiple breaches of contract to collect the money the city is owed. With that, council members, I want to thank the committees for this opportunity to update you on Do It's important work, and I am now happy to take your questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm just gonna ask a few brief questions and I'm gonna hand it over uh, to my uh, co-chair here. Um, I'm curious to know about the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, um, which imposes the Mayor's Office of Nightlife and the Mayor's Office of Film, Theater, and Broadcasting, which is located under your, uh, under Dewitt's budget. Why is the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment budget housed under Dewitt's budget? Um, Chair, as you know, uh, Do It is a fairly large agency. We have almost 2,000 employees. And one source of great strength uh, in the agency is we have, um, we perform a lot of administrative functions very well. So our general counsel's office, our budget office, uh, our HR capacity. And so we perform these administrative functions for a number of smaller offices in the city to create efficiencies. So the, your agency, uh, for example, the, uh, the nightlife office, I would imagine you know, whoever is in charge of nightlife, they're actually visiting nightlifes. So you're telling me someone from Do It is visiting these clubs and bars and nightlife? I wish, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, that falls under the mayor's office of media and entertainment. And in 2016, I believe, that office was expanded to include this nightlife capacity. If you have specific questions on it, I would be thrilled to put you in touch with Anne de Castillo, who runs the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and oversees that whole function. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make more sense for the Mayor's Office of Nightlife to be, under the, to be located under the budget of the Department of Consumer Affairs? Um, as I said, Chair, um, 
do it performs the administrative functions because we have such strong administrative capacities. All right. Um, so going to the administrative functions. So the mayor's office of film, theater, and broadcasting. One of the concerns that I have, so I have two studios. I have York Studios and Silver Cup Studios in my, in my council district. And one of the issues that I'm having is that these studios are basically getting uh, permits, uh, no parking permits surrounding their entire facility. And it's, it's, it's causing a rift between the community and the, uh, the studio. Is that a function that Do It is responsible for? That is not a function that Do It is responsible for, but if there are any offices under Do It's larger um umbrella that we service with these administrative functions, I would be happy to work with you to get to the bottom what, of it. What administrative functions do you perform for, um, let's say, the Mayor's Office of Nightlife? Sure, we do all of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment's hiring. We do their procurements. Uh, we do their budgeting um, so that each of these smaller offices don't have to replicate those functions. It's really a question of creating efficiencies. Okay. All right. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to ask a little bit about Link NYC, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Chair, Chair um, Holden. So City Bridge, the en entity responsible for the maintenance and operation of Link NYC kiosk, only paid $2.6 million as part of its contract with the cities related to advertisement revenue. And this was subsequently less than the two previous fiscal years. Why did City Bridge pay only $2.6 million in fiscal year 2019? So in fiscal year 2019, that's true, they paid $2.6 million of the $32.3 million owed. And so far in FY20, they have paid us zero of the $43.7 million owed. That's on top of revenues that they told us that they've collected from advertising of $105 million. Uh, to me, it's unacceptable that they haven't paid. As I said in my testimony, I believe that the city has bent over backwards to work with City Bridge to uh, amend the franchise agreements, to grant forbearance, uh, to make things work. And I can't speak for them about why they haven't paid. I have no patience for it. Will the city pursue litigation to recoup this money? Uh, as I said in my testimony, Chair, the city will pursue every pathway we have available to us to, one, collect the money that the city is owed, and two, to keep the Link NYC program moving forward, I believe, very strongly in um, what the franchise agreement was set up to do, which was to pro provide free internet service and phone service to New Yorkers across all five boroughs. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to recognize that we've been joined by, uh, we have uh, Chair Hoden, Chair Moya, Council Members Ayala, Rivera, Traeger, Landers, Constantinidis, and Lansman. Am I missing anyone? Okay. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Chair Holden. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, I appreciate your testimony. It was very, very complete, and I think um, very forceful. I like the idea of questioning City Bridge, um, which I don't see those, I don't see the Link NYC, I don't see the kiosk in my district, like, as you mentioned. Uh, I didn't see them when I came to visit you. Right, yes, and, um, I, and I asked um, uh, Gredencic, uh, Councilman Gredencic, and he didn't even know what these were, <laughs> because in his district it didn't get out there apparently yet. So this is the problem we're facing, and you and you touched upon it that um, Queens and uh, many other other boroughs are forgotten, other than Manhattan. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I'd like to know what your plan is if City Bridge doesn't come through with the money. What's the city's plan to recoup the the money that's owed us? So as I said in my testimony, we are prepared to exercise every right that we have under the franchise agreement. To speak in specific detail about it, because it does involve a legal agreement, I'm happy to right. let our general counsel, Michael Pastor, brief you in full. 
Just to add to that point, Council Member, I mean, we, what we have is a contract, and the contract has an, in it a number of protections. Um, and one of the means we might go about to uh, protect the city's interests would be to, inf to pursue enforcement of those provisions. And in addition, there are, there are provisions in those contracts that give us security in the event a vendor is not performing, and that's another tool at our disposal. But so th just what we're concerned about is that you may modify the contract again to like bend over backwards, uh, so to speak. That's what, uh, are you gonna draw a line in the sand this time? I mean, I, you, I, I saw your resolve. I mean, it, it seemed forceful. I just want to make sure we don't keep renegotiating things and giving them more time. As I said in my testimony, okay. Chair Holden, <laughs> right. our patience is up. Good, okay. Well, that's what I wanted to hear. I wanted to get that on the record, so your patience is up, and I, I kind of read that. <laughs> um, just want to make sure that we, we draw the line in the sand. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll, let me just go one, one more thing with the Link NYC. Um, I think City Bridge was saying they ran into obstacles. What, do you, do, you, um, do you, you understand some of those obstacles or are you buying it? Or tell me what you feel about the obstacles that they faced with uh, some of the uh, installations. The time for talking about obstacles is up. We as I testified, we renegotiated the franchise agreements in 2018. At that time, City Bridge testified publicly at the FCRC and said that with the renegotiated franchise agreements, they would now be able to fully perform under their contract with the city. So, so the City Bridge reasoning for not paying um, the city what, what it, uh, it owed us. Uh, like I said, are you, do you, do you hear, I mean, the, the fact that the city kind of renegotiated it, kind of, the way they, they modified uh, the contract, means that they understood, they, they realized there was a problem, the city realized there was a problem, is that, is that the case? I'll have to ask our general counsel to answer that. Right. He was deeply involved in those negotiations. Okay. Sure, council member. So one of the key components of the amendment that was passed in 2018 uh, was to extend the time to perform. Uh, so if you hear from City Bridge that um, it, it's difficult to perform, uh, giving a vendor more time to perform is the kind of solution you think that would get them there. Um, so the, the, that, that uh, uh, argument was made. Uh, we took it into consideration, and obviously we supported that amendment. We thought that amendment was worthwhile, but we thought we were done. Okay. All right, enough about City Bridge now. We'll move on. Um, we we'll, may come back to it because you'll have other uh, council members asking questions. So, Commissioner Tish, you've been, um, you had the opportunity to review your department's uh, operations. Um, not much time, but you had a little time to review it. Um, are there new initiatives, other than what you testified, your testimony had, um, that you plan to implement and, and improve the department's operations? Um, Chair Holden. Because um, we did, get, I mean, to just say, we, you know, we met with uh, a lot of companies and tech companies, and we did get a lot of complaints about the agency. So, I told you this already. Uh, Chair Holden, as you referenced, I am a new commissioner. I've been on the job for two and a half months. I am working diligently to survey the entire agency. Uh, through that process, I am assessing where our impact can be the greatest and where reforms are needed. And I look forward to keeping you and your committee very much informed as part of that process, but I am not prepared today to speak beyond the programs that I laid out in the testimony about any new specific initiatives, other than to say that um, my goal is to modernize the city's IT infrastructure, and that is the course that I am charting for do it. It's what I've done in my previous job at the NYPD, and it's what, frankly, I know how to do. Okay. Um, 
uh, about the department, uh, do its uh, organization. Um, it's broken, your, do its budget is broken out into several areas, which include the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment, which we mentioned, 311, Customer Service Center, and Cyber Command, amongst others. What, in what ways are you working with these offices to understand their budgetary and operational needs? Um, Chair Holden, I'll start um, answering the question and then for more specificity, I'll turn it over to our Associate Commissioner who oversees our uh, budget for the past 20 years, John Winker. Um, and I will just start by saying um, that we perform many of the administrative functions for these smaller entities that fall under the do it umbrella. As I said, the council's office, procurement, HR, budgeting. But if you have specific questions about it, John Winker can answer. Good afternoon. Yes, with regard to these other units of appropriations that we created within our budget structure, we do work with the various departments and, and those entities, agencies, whatever you want to call them, uh, to determine what their funding needs are. Then we'll communicate those to OMB, justify them, et cetera, et cetera. And then, as the commissioner stated, we'll work with them to administer, whether it be hires, procurements, payments, et cetera. So it, that's really the extent that we're working with them. All right, uh, but how often do you have meetings with the heads of these offices to discuss any operational challenges or, pro or progression? Uh, well, the operational challenge, to the extent that they have a fiscal impact or an administrative impact, it'll be as needed. Uh, with regard to resource needs, it'll be during the financial plan process. And I would just say, in my two months at do it, two and a half months at do it, I've met with most of them, most of the agency heads. Okay. Um, moving on to some technology projects. Um, over time, this is, this, is, uh, this is historic, and it's, uh, um, we've seen uh, problems arise with large-scale technology projects or contracts across the city. There's a history of that, as you, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, under the Emergency Communications Transformation Program, ECTP, and then the New York City Wireless Network, and now the delay in the implementation of NextGen 911, which is frustrating, but you know we get, it keeps getting pushed back. And you know, I was glad to hear the text not to 911 is finally coming, but some people out there are saying they'll believe it when they see it. So, but Fair. It's, a, it, it's a very important, you know, because we, we've been burned a few times, so. Um, Touche. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. I like that, I like that you're, un you're understanding, because um, you, do, you are forceful, and I, I've, I've met with you a number of times. Uh, can you explain to the committee, though, which entity or which person in the agency is responsible for overseeing the large-scale citywide technology projects? I mean, I guess they're here. Me. You. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the so buck stops So I believe you. the buck stops with me. Okay. It's part of my management style. I'm a very deeply engaged leader. I believe in, well, first of all, transparency, but second of all, in delivering IT programs on time and on budget. Things happen. Uh, if things do happen, you have my commitment that you will hear it from me first. I'm a very transparent leader, but um, as I said in my testimony, this is what I do. And when I say me, I mean the buck stops with me, but one of the things I've most enjoyed in my few months at Do It is getting to meet a lot of very talented IT leaders in that organization. And also I've recruited a number of new talented IT leaders to come and join me. Uh, in particular, we have a new chief operating officer, a new deputy chief operating officer, a new deputy commissioner of infrastructure, a new chief information security officer. I'm going to forget someone, but needless to say, we've hired almost 30 people. There are a lot of fantastic people in that agency, and I'm going to have that agency uh, focused on 
delivering IT transformation on time and on budget. I'll just say one other thing. In the area of public safety, which I know has been um, a source of concern for you and for the committee and for the council in, in general, I have created a new position called Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. And I have appointed to that position one of the most talented IT leaders I have had the pleasure of meeting. And that is Deputy Commissioner Steve Hart who spent many, many, many years working at Do It before he joined me at the NYPD where he worked very closely with Do It on a number of uh, 911 programs. Under Steve Hart, we've created for the first time a public safety division that is so of 140 people that is solely responsible for new 911 projects, so Next Gen 911, Text to 911, as well as the maintenance, support, and partnership with the Fire Department, with the NYPD, with Cyber Command on all things 911. So under Steve's leadership, I feel really good sitting here testifying before the council and telling you we are on this 911 stuff and I expect that we will deliver these systems on time and on budget. That's encouraging. I appreciate that. Um, one other question, then I'll turn it over to my co-chair to ask uh, that our council members ask questions. But what leadership lessons has Do It learned from the issues that arose from the nice win shutdown last year? Or it will some most of it will shut down this year, right? Uh, but what what lessons have we learned? Um, I can't speak really to the. Uh, lessons that were learned uh, during the nice win issue, I can just tell you that I am committed to modernizing the city's IT infrastructure. I'm committed to um, getting the basics done right, because you can't do the sexy until you have the basics done the right way and uh, cybersecurity, building modern platforms. This is all fundamental to the work we're rolling up our sleeves and doing now. I should also say that in city government, um, in this job, I look as like my top partner <laughs> in this uh, is Jeff Brown, the director of Cyber Command, who rolls up his sleeves, is very detail-oriented, has created an amazing organization that is really a gem um, and a gift to New York City government and to all city agencies. Thank you again, and uh, I'll turn it over to my co-chair. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Holden. So now we will be uh, taking questions from um, the, the council members, and we will uh, each member will get three minutes to ask their questions, and we will start with uh, Chair Moya. Thank you. Thank you to both chairs. Thank you uh, as well uh, for being here. Just uh, quickly on the cable television franchise, uh, cable television franchise contracts uh, will expire in 2020. These contracts provided hundreds of millions of dollars to revenue to the city each year, uh, revenues that may be in jeopardy due to the recent FCC uh, rulings that require that uh, the INET cost, uh, public access operating cost, and certain other fees be treated uh, as in-kind contributions uh, that are deducted from the cash paid to the city under the city's franchise. Uh, has the agency prepared an orderly process to renew these contracts? Uh, and when can we expect an authorizing resolution? The high level answer is yes. <laughs> um, for the details of it, I'm going to ask our general counsel, Michael Pastor, um, to respond. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you, Councilmember uh, Moya. Yes, we have a detailed process that is in place right now. Uh, we've been collecting feedback from the community as to their needs. Uh, we are in the process of preparing a draft authorizing resolution in conjunction with other city agencies uh, that we hope to deliver to the Council for your review uh, very soon. Great. Um, how will the city provide support for the public access channels uh, to continue and expand their current levels of service if the funds the cable system pays to the access center are deducted from the municipal franchise fees. 
uh, that the cable companies pay to the city? So the number one way we can support uh, those organizations uh, is fighting the FCC. Um, we are active in the litigation again the, against the FCC. The FCC is our problem in that regard. We are completely aligned with the community access organizations, actively involved in national organizations that are fighting that off. Uh, so I think that the two things we do is we fight uh, the FCC in court and we also communicate regularly with those organizations and, and keep very close uh, to them as, as to their needs. Great. Uh, and my last question. Uh, so it's been over 1,100 days since workers at Spectrum have been on strike. Uh, where does the Spectrum franchise agreement stand uh, in your opinion? Uh, and in your opinion, are they worthy of terminating the franchise, uh, terminating the franchise agreement based on the labor uh, rulings that have come against them? So I appreciate your concerns on this issue, council member, and I share in them. We are monitoring the strike closely, and as you know, this administration will always stand on the side of the workers. We want fair contracts. Um, for the specifics on this, again, our general counsel. So um, where we are, as, as the council member is aware, um, we have provisions in our franchise agreement that prohibit uh, charter from violating federal law and also from not using best efforts to find local vendors for their business. Uh, we uh, vigorously enforce those provisions. Uh, we've defaulted charter uh, once for each of those provisions, and we also defaulted them for miscalculation of fees that netted the city $4 million uh, in revenue. Uh, to the council member's specific question about renewal, uh, as we've discussed at prior hearings, um, the renewal process is uh, sketched out in federal law, and indeed federal law ties the hands of municipalities um, uh, as to what factors can be considered when, uh, when renewal comes up. Uh, so we will be looking at those factors um, uh, on the renewal question and uh, I would say, you know, the entire track record uh, of the company uh, at the time of renewal. Thank you. I, I just want to say I just hope that that does not get lost uh, as we move forward with the franchise agreements that are coming up. Uh, it is extremely disheartening to know that so many workers and so many families right now uh, are suffering because of the refusal of a company that comes into the city of New York uh, that's gaining all these benefits, uh, just refuses to sit down and uh, actually do the right thing uh, for its workers. Uh, I just think it's very troubling for me. If I may, I can commit to you, council member, it will not get lost. Thank you. We will now recognize um, Councilmember Lansman, um, followed by Landers, Rivera, and Trader. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Commissioner, you testified, as you know, this administration will always stand on the side of workers. And I have to be honest with you, in this uh, situation with Spectrum and Local 3, I haven't seen much evidence of that. These folks have been on strike since 2017, and we have been begging and imploring the administration to use every tool at its disposal to try to uh, uh, force Spectrum to negotiate a good faith resolution to this dispute. And to this day, that has not happened. I'm uh, alarmed that we're in March and this contract, the franchise is gonna expire, expire in July, as I understand, and this council has still not been given uh, an authorizing resolution to consider. Um, I want to know whether or not you intend to put into this authorizing resolution the maximum labor protections allowed under the law. And is that a goal and an aim of, of this resolution so that any uh, uh, potential provider who wants to compete for this franchise will be constrained to conduct themselves consistent with both the law when it comes to labor relations and our values as New Yorkers, because this franchisee has not. Yes, uh, council member, so we are committed to, to answer your, your first question to, to um, uh, approaching the authorizing resolution process with an as expansive view as we can on the labor question. I just wanted to add to that point, um, one of the things that we included in the mobile telecom franchise, which was recently approved by the FCRC, was some of the most expansive reporting requirements on the labor issue specifically that we've ever had, such that we know that those franchisees will, re will be reporting in data to us uh, as to how they treat their workers, and that's something we are going to actively pursue as well for the cable franchise. So at least on that front, we're going to increase our, our do its awareness and knowledge of 
the work, the work, the treatment of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And unsurprisingly, a company that will abuse its workforce will also abuse its consumers and its customers. What can you tell us that will be in uh, uh, um, this franchise process that will deal with what the controller found in a report in July, I think, of last year, that 29% of New York City, ha City households lack broadband access, that in many communities, a third of the households lack any internet access whatsoever. What are you going to do to make sure that this company or whichever company gets the franchise actually provides access to New Yorkers? So I think that the, the biggest thing there, council member, that we are focusing on is competition, because a lack of competition undergirds the entire problem. Uh, one of the problems we face right now is we don't have a ready mechanism to give internet franchises to other companies other than the charters. So before my time expires, I apologize for interrupting. I understand what you're saying. I want to get this last question in. This counts. By, giving the, by, by, by doing the authorizing resolution so close to the expiration of the franchise, isn't, for want of a better term, the fix in? Or if not a fix, because that is a connotation I don't want to suggest. Have you really made it possible for other providers to compete and be able to take over that, that franchise agreement when this expires if it's not going to go to Charter or Spectrum? So I think uh, we definitely think that the process for the authorizing res resolution will not be squeezed. It will be rigorous. It will be robust. The other point I was trying to make, which I can get back to another time, is a state law. That's on that your time, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the, the other issue uh, that we face is, as I was mentioning, is a lack of competition. So right now, we don't have an easy mechanism to give other uh, um, fiber, uh, fiber providers a, a franchise for internet service. Um, and we have a proposal that we are going to be taking to Albany to try to get that fixed. Um, if we get that fixed, what it means is we'd finally have the ability to open up uh, internet franchises to a whole new cadre of companies. Um, and when you do that, then you have a new entrant, you have new competitors, and any abusive uh, behavior on the part of any incumbent, um, they get squeezed. And in fairness, this has been on Dewitt's legislative agenda for Albany for a while. For how long have we been working on this? Two years. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll take questions from Councilmember Landers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioner. Welcome. Uh, good to have you in this job. Congratulations. Um, I'm going to start by asking about this question that you know, the sentence that starts your third paragraph. I have a bold vision for the future of technology in New York City, and I am working on a plan to modernize the city's technology infrastructure. Um, I have seen a lot of the city's technology infrastructure as I've visited a wide range of agencies. And I, we've talked today, you talked about NextGen 911 and the, the link kiosks, but like most of the technology are old terminals connected to some printer that's from 1982. Not at the NYPD. So. Um, I, and I saw some of what you did at the NYPD, but I just, so I'm excited about the idea of a plan that genuinely modernizes the city's technology infrastructure, and certainly we need it if we're going to deliver to public assistance recipients and homeless residents and New York City school kids the same kind of first-rate modern technology that you worked on. I, I imagine though that's going to, like, cost a, a decent amount of money, and it looks to me like there's 240,000 in new needs in the Do It budget proposal this year, so can you speak a little more to, like, what that plan is, when it's coming, what it's going to look like, what its ambitions are, how it's going to how much it's sure. going to cost, how we should prepare for we it. We are, I am, since day one, have been doing a deep dive into the operations, the budget, the personnel, all things do it at the agency, um, and really working diligently to survey uh, the entire agency. Um, through that process, we're doing a full assessment of where the impacts can be greatest. And I look forward to um, briefing this committee on it in full over the next several weeks and months, and certainly as part of the executive budget cycle. Okay, so, we, so you want to do that. You've just been there a little bit. You don't yet, the, the current budget does not include your ambitious plan, but you anticipate bringing us some significant new steps in that direction in time for us to review them for the executive budget. As part started. of the assessment that we're doing, we're looking at the current budget available to do it, what 
can be done with it. And we're assessing other types of modernization that may be required. Okay, so uh, you know, I'll just stay on this point, and I might need to go up a second round. I mean, I'm enthusiastic about your leadership, but there's less than two years left of this administration, and if the kind of stuff. How long were you at the NYPD? Six years. Six years. Okay, so if we're going to get started and do a serious modernization of our technology infrastructure, then we need like a real plan and real resources. So we look forward in the executive budget to seeing more of what that looks like and really Thank getting you. started. All right, I have some questions in round two as well. But Thank you, uh, Councilman Hernandez. Um, okay, next up, Councilman Rivera. Hello. Hi. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I wanted to ask about the links again. Um, and I realize the financial challenges aside, and I'm, I'm sorry that there is clearly issues and problems there. But I, I have a lot of links, link NYCs in my district. I, I, I believe we were the, the almost the pilot, if I'm not incorrect. I represent District 2, which is like the east side, Union Square. And I want to ask, what is the plan to expand these to the outer boroughs, considering? So um, in my testimony, I said that City Bridge today is 537 links behind on their deployment plan. The vast majority of those, if not all of them, are supposed to be cited in the outer boroughs. Um, I can't give you a timeline at this time because City Bridge hasn't installed a new Link NYC kiosk since 2018. Okay. So I also read somewhere recently that there was an issue with just the maintenance of the existing ones that are installed. Is, has that been rectified? So whenever we are notified at Do It of a maintenance issue, we let City Bridge know, and it is my understanding that they have been doing the regular maintenance of the links that have been activated. Do you know how many are working and how many aren't? Um, I believe there are, uh, is it 50 that haven't been activated? There are 50 links that have been installed but have not yet been activated by City Bridge. Um, the others have all been activated, so it's like 1,750. So you have 1,750 working right now? Well, active, yes, activated links. I can't speak to, was there one that has a maintenance problem at this hearing, but I can go back to the office afterwards and follow up with you on the specific numbers if we have any out of service for maintenance reasons that had previously been activated. Sure, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I also okay. wanted to ask, you know, we have many of them, and I, and I understand the original purpose was to replace the phone booth. And so I have many of them, sometimes I have like two on a block, and so we do receive a few complaints about the quality of life and how people are utilizing them, and I wonder what steps have you taken to kind of addressing the concerns associated with Link NYC, and maybe it's people just hanging out all day, sometimes they're aggressive, sometimes they're not. And what is the process to removing links that are in locations that are just clearly not working for the residents and are maybe the sidewalk is too narrow or it's too busy of a, an area? So thank you for that question. Um, anytime there is an issue with a link, like for example, a quality of life issue, as you referenced, um, when that issue is brought to do its attention, we have a team of 10 people who work specifically on, on the links. Um, when that issue is brought to our attention, we work with our partners at the NYPD and DHS to assess uh, the quality of life issue um, and to get to the bottom of it. So um, the entity to tell about a link problem is definitely do it and then we take it to NYPD and DHS and do an assessment. Well, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to working with you. I'm sorry thank I'm you, not 
always on the technology committee. It seems very interesting. Um, but it was very nice to hear from you. And thank you to the chairs for uh, giving me so much time. But, but I'll take some of your kiosk in my... You can, have some, you can have some of them. You can have some of them. I'll bring them to you. I know exactly which ones I want to remove. You heard that, Commissioner. It's on the record. All right. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, uh, Councilmember Traeger? Thank you, Chairs, and uh, thank you, Commissioner. And I really appreciate your, uh, you know, very serious uh, interest and commitment to these issues that we're hearing today. I, I, I sense it from, from here, and I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I represent one of those outer boroughs. I actually consider Southern Brooklyn the outer, outer borough, which some folks in City Hall forget about. Um, and it's my understanding that when I was asked this question a number of years ago about why the link systems are not reaching my part of the world, it was not just about the company and the financial issues. I was told by the administration that we have virtually no infrastructure in place in my end of the world to even uh, you know, welcome link kiosks into our region. Is that is that your understanding as well? I don't know what specific neighborhood you're... Coney Island. Coney Island. Um, how's about this? Why don't we meet uh, after this and I can we can walk through the specific infrastructure that is in place in that area? Sure. But I don't think that that should be a reason why you wouldn't have links because it is my understanding that as part of the franchise agreements that the vendor or the franchisee needs to get the infrastructure there to support it. Yeah, so I'm just repeating answers that I was told by senior city hall officials, which I could debrief with you afterwards. So let's debrief on it. You let's got it. Let's make sure I didn't misspeak. Sure. And let's get to the bottom of it. I would appreciate that. Um, I also want to ask about, in addition to Link, when I, I, I learned this, you know, when I chaired the Recovery Resiliency Committee, so I'm going to raise some issues with you as well. Number one, the City of New York apparently partners with some private companies like AT&T and others to provide free Wi-Fi in parks. Is that correct? Like the Central Park provide, have free Wi-Fi with, with an AT&T agreement, is that correct? That is correct. There are some partnerships with some companies for free Wi-Fi in certain parks. Correct. So I pointed out that we have agreements with AT&T, I think maybe Google and, or other, some folks, in Central Park. I believe also, is it Prospect Park as well? There, there are some Wi-Fi uh, hotspots in, in, in Prospect Park as well. And are there agreements with a company for Dumbo in, in Brooklyn as well? It's park by park, uh, so I, I'm not off the hand, off hand aware of anything in Dumbo, but I can certainly check for you. And many of these decisions were, were handled by the Bloomberg administration originally, is that correct? Yes. But they're still in place today, is that correct? Yes. So just to paint a picture for the public, when we hear about inequity and fairness and issues, you have free Wi-Fi in Central Park, you have free Wi-Fi in Prospect Park, you do not have free Wi-Fi for folks in Coney Island along the boardwalk. You do not. Cable vision or optimum, you have to be a customer, it's only for about a few minutes, you have to pay. So that is a serious equity issue in the city of New York, and I encourage folks to look at the agreements and to re-examine them and how to reach areas, lower income neighborhoods that can't have, that really could use that help to bridge the digital divide. And the last point I'll make is on the same topic. I passed a bill in the last term uh, to, to require the Climate Change Adaptation Task Force to look at uh, communication resiliency. Because one of the th lessons learned from Hurricane Sandy was communication systems were down during the storm. Folks could not, folks were, were told, call 911, but you couldn't reach the 911 system. Um, and so, matter of fact, in the case of the Rockaways, the way folks knew there was a fire, they pulled the old firebox. It wasn't through a phone call. So what have we done? Are we better prepared today in terms of communication resiliency, Wi-Fi networks to reach emergency personnel in the event of a major storm? I have to look into that, the details of that, and probably put you in touch with our new Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety, Steve Hart, who can have very long conversations with you about this. Would appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you, Commissioner, and, and thank you, Chairs, for your time. And thank you for raising the issue uh, about the parks to our attention. Thank you.
Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Commissioner, um, a few questions regarding uh, miscellaneous revenue, uh, cable uh, television franchises. Since uh, fiscal 2016, DOT has seen a decrease of approximately $8 million in cable television franchises. Do you anticipate revenue from cable television franchises to continue decreasing in the outer years? Uh, certainly with cord cutting. Um, anecdotally, yeah. and most has, people has I know are getting rid of their cable boxes and moving to streaming services. Has your agency made a, uh, a projection or estimate of how much uh, yes, I believe we did. Do you have um, the cable on? I can get that, uh, if not at the hearing right now, yeah. I can get that information I to you. I appreciate it, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then my last question, do cable television franchise agreements include revenue from internet service provided by these companies? They do not. And that's part of the reason we're focusing on that state law fix. Right. Yeah, that's the legislation that we've been pushing for two years. And there's an opportunity to generate revenue. It should yes, be part of it. Yes, and that would, if we were able to do that, it would more than make up the shortfall from the decline in the cable franchise revenue. You have an estimate of how much that would generate? Uh, estimated for 40 million a year. 40 million a year, wow, okay. My, my office would be whatever help I can provide to you in this, uh, on the Thank state you. level to advocate for that. That's Thank important. You. All right. Thank All right. You. With that, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to my co-chair, uh, Chair Holden. Thank you. I, I have two questions, and then I'll jump. You'll, you'll get it, um, uh, Councilman Lander. Um, just to back on, uh, on, the, on the Link NYC, um, I thought that was a typo in your testimony that they haven't installed uh, any links uh, uh, since the fall of 2018. Uh, but I haven't heard why. I, you know, we, we haven't heard anything about why they stopped and why they were allowed to stop. I, well, they certainly haven't been allowed to stop. It's not like the city authorized them to stop. But in terms of why they stopped, I'd love for you to ask Google or City Bridge, why they stopped rolling out free Wi-Fi services in the city of New York, which they signed up to do as part of their franchise agreement with New York City. So we have no clue as to why the contract, was like they didn't hold up to the contract and they stopped installing in the magical fall of 2018. At a high level, this is not going to be acceptable to you because it's not to me, but at a high level, what I understand is they're crying poor, and for me that doesn't work when you're talking about Google. Google is crying that they don't have enough money? That's historic. Um, that's why I hit it in my testimony. Okay. So that's why you didn't want to say it outright, because it's so absurd. I feel like I said it. <laughs> well, you didn't really, you, you, we really, it, it, they never, they were crying poverty. That needs to be the headlines um, in, in any newspaper or whatever, on any um, news uh, station, because um, New Yorkers are being shortchanged. Um, so just a crystal ball, do you expect them to honor uh, or meet their contract obligations by the end of the year, this year? Do you expect that? Does the city expect that? To meet their full contractual obligations yes. by the end of the, the year? That would require uh, the installation of a lot of links very quickly, so I don't want to speak to that, but I certainly encourage them to immediately pay the city what they owe us and to restart the rollout of free Wi-Fi services per their franchise agreement with New York City that they voluntarily entered into, that the city already renegotiated once. Okay, so you, you've been in touch with um, uh, City Bridge and, and trying to get them moving since you came in. Since you came in. Since I came in, yes. And our general counsel for years. Okay. All right. 
All right, I'll, I'll just, uh, you have a couple of questions, Councilman Lander. Thank you. Um, so you talked in your testimony about 5G uh, and the plans for implementation there, and you know, we heard from a couple of folks about some of the cable challenges in terms of worker protections, worker safety, and I guess I just want to ask in terms of these new 5G agreements, and I saw some things reported in the media but didn't get much details, like what's in place to make sure public safety is protected, worker safety and standards are protected, public access is as broad as we can make it in the new 5G uh, solicitation sure. and plans and agreements. Thank you for that question. So we actually recently in the past month or so got 12 new mobile telecommunications franchise agreements approved. And those agreements have unprecedented protections and provisions in those areas. Michael can give you chapter and verse on that. Yes, council member. So basically, um, it is an unprecedented um, requirement on all of all 12 of those franchisees to report a huge swath of data as to how their workforces are treated. Um, I thought I heard you also mention access, and if by that you mean where these installations will be, no. Okay. I've been. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm happy to know okay. some things about that, but I guess more uh, getting to more universal. Uh, access, uh, how we get towards sort of the 5G equivalent of broadband for all. Uh, you know, these are private companies and yet we're giving them yeah. public access, so I'm hoping that we're giving them some standards to achieve sure. a more affordable 5G access. Well, the, the way that we control um, where 5G is rolled out, i.e. that it's rolled out equitably, that we don't build 5G in midtown Manhattan and not in the outer boroughs, the way we make sure that we don't have 5G deserts um, is through our poll reservation process. So when the carriers uh, start to build out these networks, they will do it on city infrastructure, city light poles, street furniture. That's what these uh, mobile telecom franchise agreements put in place is the ability for them to use these city assets. But in order to do that, they need to request to use specific assets of the city. And we are hammering out now provisions in that reservation process, is what we call it, uh, that will ensure that as the carriers build out the network geographically, that it's done equitably. Meaning, if you want one pole in Manhattan, you, pole you have to do one Manhattan. pole in the Bronx Correct. or some like version that. of that. Yep. Uh, okay, that's good. Yeah, are there any provisions for attending to sort of the affordable, so it's great if the thing's in the Bronx, but if I can't afford it, is, is there any way to use this opportunity to influence the provision of so affordable access? So we've limited powers when it comes to price um, based upon federal regulations, but uh, striking back to a point we made earlier, since we have 12, the more competition, the better. Um, so I think our focus is on competition, 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 and equitable distribution. One thing I know some in other places um, when this has happened, uh, the folks that have gotten the agreements then hired subcontractors who were either like didn't practice safety protocols and I won Crown Castle subcontractor at an explosion or then those subcontractors violated worker rights. Do we have provisions to make sure we're covering subcontractors as well? Yes, the provisions we described earlier go to that very point. One of the things we're gonna be demanding from the franchisees in that data pool is data as to what uh, subcontractors they're using. Okay, that's great. All right, and then my last question is kind of begins or ends where, uh, the, where Chair Salamanca began on an area that you wouldn't, a normal New Yorker would not believe was sitting at the Department of Information uh, Technology uh, and Telecommunications. Uh, but it's my understanding that the city's commitments through the Civic Engagement Commission to roll out citywide participatory budgeting, which two thirds of the voters of New York voted for back in 2018, uh, rest at do it. Uh, is that, that, am I correct in that understanding? Um, or the money moves through do its part of the budget. Yeah, I don't so mean you're implementing we, it. But. We provide for the administrative functions for a number of smaller offices. And so, yes, the participatory budgeting does flow through do it. 
And right now, there's about seven staff at the Civic Engagement Commission. And last year at this time, there were no staff at the Civic Engagement Commission. So seven is, a, is an improvement, and we're projecting to keep those. But there's no dollar commitment for the pieces of participatory budgeting that New Yorkers are supposed to get to vote on and that they voted by ballot referendum to achieve. Is that so, correct? So I happen to be a big fan of participatory budgeting. I know you didn't ask my personal opinion about it. I'm but glad to hear I it. Also know that you advocated for that important program. And I have to say that it's amazing that it's grown from four council members to almost the entire council so uh, quickly. Um, as an aside, I live in Council Member Kalos's district and I'm looking forward to voting next month. But to answer your specific question head on, as the budget director testified yesterday, I believe, um, we expect that the money uh, will be added by adoption. Okay, so it's not in the prelim, but we can see it. Well, wait, by adoption or, or we'll see it in the executive budget? By adoption. All right. I thought I heard the mayor say in the briefing to the council that it would be in the executive budget. By what, what I have in my notes is by adoption. Okay. Uh, well, I'll follow up with the folks that were at the meeting with the mayor because he told us that it would be in the executive budget. Maybe we'll get it even higher from the executive budget but at adoption. But um, all right, do you know how much Paris uh, puts into its citywide participatory budgeting? I do not, but All can right. you tell me? Oh, it's over 100 million euros, and euros are even more than dollars, as I understand it. So um, we would love to be first again. And you know, to be first, we could count the 35 million that the council's already putting in, but I hope the mayor will at least exceed what the council puts in and put us on path to really be taking leadership for local democracy. So thank you, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just a few more questions. Um, in the citywide savings program, do it will generate savings through decommissioning of systems the agency no longer needs and the introduction of more efficient processes across the agency. Can you elaborate more on these savings and which systems it will impact? Uh, John Winker can elaborate more on it, but I want you to know that this is all part of the assessment that is going on now, so he can um, elaborate as to like what the current plan has been, but it may be subject to change over the next few weeks sure. as we get a yeah. hold on everything. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, I can give you a, more of a high level at this particular point. If you want, we can give you some more detailed information subsequent to the hearing. I mean, it really is so so software. Uh, software as a service subscription types of things that we're eliminating, hardware decommissioning, support services that we're reducing. Those are the types of things that we're doing and we have done over the course of the year to achieve the savings that we have identified. All right. Um, let's talk about the vacancy rate at DOIT. Um, as of November 2019, the department was operating with a vacancy rate of 12.3%. Yeah, that's equivalent to about 225 vacant positions. Uh, can you provide additional information as to the type of vacant positions the agency has? Do you have that, John? I don't have the specifics in terms of titles and things along those lines, but since November, we have hired a significant number of uh, positions, <laughs> so the vacancies right now and do it proper are, are quite low. The vacancies that do exist primarily are in cyber and other non do it proper offices and entities. So, um, so we, can you get us what your vacancy rate is? We will. Uh, Absolutely. You know, after, yeah. Um, is there an attrition rate that you can also get, get us? Like, are we losing people? We are losing people. It's roughly 7%, uh, but we're hiring at a higher rate. So as in the past years, we were basically just treading water on vacancies. We're now actually filling those vacancies and making a headway on that. And so, you, yeah, go ahead. My, my goal, like vacancy rate, wherever I work, is um, or attrition rate, is something that I look at very closely. My goal is to um, help do it, continue to be a place where people want to work where they feel proud of their work and where they're respected for their work. So the vacancy rate and the attrition rate is something that we're gonna look very closely at going forward. 
So um, you said that in the cyber command we're, we're lacking? Well, there's vacancies there, correct. The vacancy. But we're, cyber we, command was funded for new positions, so I think that the vacancy rate there is a function of the hiring that I know is going on there now because we handle their hiring for them and our HR director is very busy doing that. Correct, yeah. they've been ramping up. But our, our uh, salaries are competitive in, in that area. I mean, I just don't want, I know what happens in the city a lot. We lose talent to private, the private industry because they're paying a lot more. Um, so do, do, you, do you know the, uh, the starting salaries of, of somebody in that area? We can get back to you on that. Okay, because um, that happens a lot in government, and that's why we can't, we can't keep people, and we, and we don't get the best talent, and that's why we have issues later on. So I just want to, I'll touch, I, I may touch upon that again. Um, let me just, um, um, in MOM, um, uh, incentive fund savings. In the preliminary plan, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment expects to generate $328,000 for savings achieved through delayed program implementation. Can you elaborate on, on how the incentive fund works and how the benefit, uh, and the benefit it generates to the city? Do you have that? I have some general information on that. I mean, the incentive program is really to incentivize production and filming within the city of New York. So what they're doing, they're achieving the savings by delaying a couple of programs. That's really the extent of the knowledge I have on this. All right. Uh, so the other questions, if you don't have much, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll send that to, uh, to you uh, in an email. Um, and I have the dollar value of their savings, if that's what you're looking yeah, for. You could, yeah. So um, there are savings of $329,000 in fiscal year 20 and $328,000 in fiscal year 21 through uh, the delay in program implementation, which is what you were discussing. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Internet Master Plan, um, so this year the uh, Chief Technology Officer issued the Internet Master to ensure that all New Yorkers will have world-class, um, they'll be connected in a world-class way um, and that will compete with other you know, large cities. Um, and uh, the ability to use the Internet to its fullest potential. Um, are there resources in do it in the do it budget to implement the master plan? Um, so we work very closely with the mayor's office of the chief technology officer, and we will definitely assist uh, where necessary. Um, I, uh, as far as uh, 5G goes, am uh, very focused on getting this uh, poll reservation phase. Uh, moving and getting working with the carriers to um, uh, deploy 5G equitably across uh, this city, but we are committed to working with the mayor's office and the chief technology officer to deploy to get broadband deployed equitably um, across the city. I will say that I thought one of the most impressive parts of the internet master plan was the data collection that they had done where that plan, if, if you read the, the first few uh, pieces of it, goes in very great detail into exactly where the broadband deserts are. And I think that you can't fix a problem until you, ha you know where it is. And I think um, that that plan offers a lot in that specific area to moving the ball forward. Okay. Um, I have a, a question about procurement card rebates. Uh, we saw that line on the, uh, the budget and we looked at the fiscal, uh, fiscal 2019 actual, the thing we saw was revenues up for procurement card rebates decreased to 281,000. Can you elaborate on that? Um, uh, Again, um, the, P the P card, program it's it's really uh, it's 
it's designed to get rebates from the credit card company for processing payments through that vendor. Uh, the vendor right now is U.S. Bank. The, the vendor that we use to make payments is Verizon, Telesector Resources. And what's happening is the reason why it's decreased is the way that DCAS has negotiated the contract, the incentive percentages have decreased over the term of the contract. My understanding is that DCAS is negotiating a new contract that should see those percentages increase under the new contract. So we will be seeing these, these percentages and the dollar values increase over time. Yeah, we were confused on that one, but so I'm glad you explained it. Thank you. Um, Sorry, 311 operations. The uh, preliminary plan, uh, the fiscal 2021 budget for 311 technical support decreases by nearly $7 million compared to the 2020 budget. Well, what is the cause uh, of the decrease in funding? Are you talking about the technology or the operations? The, the technical, the technology. So 311 is a big part of the assessment that uh, is underway now, so I'd like to talk to you about um, 3 and one in the coming weeks and months and what the city's needs there are. So it's not going to impact service in 3 and one to New Yorkers? 3 and one is a, one of the most critical services to New Yorkers as we're dealing with COVID now. You hear the mayor uh, keep sending people to 3 and one for, you know, the most up-to-date city messaging so no the three so, one program is not yeah I, I outlined some some improvements and you mentioned you that in your testimony um which um because i'm with you know when it started i thought three one was one one was a godsend uh, especially for quality of life obviously in new york city and um it was it was it was a great system when it came out and but I think we've fallen behind looking at, I've been researching other systems, 311 systems throughout the uh, nation, and they, they seem a little bit more user friendly. I mentioned that to you. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's what we're concerned about, um, that can we make the improvements um, faster? Because it seems like I make a suggestion and it takes years to implement. Because um, I have made suggestions over the years, even before I was a council member. I, I, I saw flaws because I use it a lot. I use, I use it almost every day <laughs> in making some complaint or you know making some um, uh, issue. Especially as a civic leader, uh, I you know I, I love the app. I think the app is great, but it needs work um, to make it better, to make it more user friendly. So, just if we uh, you know any reduction in, in the costs and um, or the software, I'd like to see changes made a little quicker. So under maybe we can talk some more. I don't understand. All right. Yeah. So um, anything else you want? I think that's it. Anybody? Uh, okay. Nobody's here. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. And again, uh, and uh, then it, I think it went pretty good, didn't it? I mean, thank it was, you. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I do. We'll see what they think. But all right. Okay. I just, but before we go, I just again, want to thank Nicklin Plummer, Marcelette Davis, Dennis Martinez, Huberta, Huberta Ugar, um, who represent the advocate community who sat through for deaf, hard of hearing um, survivors of domestic violence, who sat through this whole hearing, listened to me drone on about so many topics, but who have really rolled up their sleeves and partnered with us over the past three months on text to 911, and to thank you and the council for uh, the wonderful introduction that you made. Well, thank you again, time. Commissioner, and I think uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I think you're up to it, and I, I think you're, I know your staff is, because, you know, speaking to your staff, they're terrific, so thanks so much again, and uh, we're, we'll, uh, we really appreciate your testimony, and the f you were very forceful. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. All right, we have our second panel. Panel two, Christopher Schuler. Let's discuss. Ruth Lowenkron. 
Professor Kleinplatz? Professor Kleinplatz? Okay. And we would hope that some, someone would stay from the administration to listen to uh, the testimony. Okay, good, thank you. So uh, Christopher, if you want to start. Schuler, you want to start? All right, just, just uh, press the uh, red button. You could start. For people who stutter and those with, with other speech disabilities, the option to, to, to text 911 is, is more than, than a matter of, of convenience. It's absolutely essential. Um, good, 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 good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Christopher Schuyler. I'm a senior staff attorney at, at the New York Lawyers for, for, for the Public Interest, the, the Disability Justice Program. Um, I am also a person who stutters and an active member of the National Stuttering Association. Uh, st 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 stuttering affects 1% uh, of the general population. Accordingly, there, there, are, there are tens of thousands of New York City residents who stutter, not to mention scores of others who, who work in and visit the city every day. While the, the, the root cause of stuttering is believed to, to, to be neurological and physiological rather than psychological, uh, it can be triggered by, by emotional and situational factors. For, for, for instance, some people who stutter experience increased difficulty speaking in situations when time is of the essence. Uh, it's also not uncommon for people who stutter to experience heightened difficulties when referring to proper nouns, such as names and places. These communication challenges, while inconvenient in everyday life, uh, can be, can be life-threatening in a true emergency. Text to 911 is imperative for people who stutter because it would remove the, the, the very real, real risks of miscommunication. When reporting an emergency, specific details are, are important, such as location, uh, specific individuals involved, and what is happening. Um, if, if a person who stutters is unable to, 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 to verbalize th these details, they, they may not receive the assistance that they need in, in a timely manner. Additionally, operators uh, that are relatively unexposed to, to stuttering are liable to misunderstand the person who stutters. Accuracy and clarity in communications is of paramount importance uh, during an emergency. T -t 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 Text 911 would alleviate these major and unnecessary barriers to effective communication. N n n n n n notably, the, the benefits of Text 911, including accuracy, um, and clarity in crucial moments are benefits shared by groups outside of those with speech disabilities. The increased accuracy and clarity provided by Text 911 would also benefit the deaf and hard of hearing communities. The visitors with limited English, English proficiency, uh, as well as individuals who need to text suddenly, such as people experiencing domestic violence. Um, or active shooter situations, um, which my colleague Lohenkron will testify to in greater detail momentarily. Text 911 um, has been implemented by hundreds of call centers around the country. By failing to implement Text 911, New York City is placing uh, countless people at risk every day. New York City must implement Text 911 without further d d d d delay. Well, thank, well, th you. Thank, thank you, Christopher. And um, uh, the, what you mentioned is hundreds of other cities are using Text 911, and New York City was lagging behind, which we were concerned with. But we did hear something. 
We heard that June. Um, I know you're hopeful. Uh, we we keep here. We've heard that for a year now that we're going. June is going to be the rollout. So we're very you know cautious because we've seen other delays that over the years. So, but I think the commissioner laid out that they've been testing it, and I, that's encouraging. So we're at a point where. Um, I'm hopeful and I have, I have confidence that they'll roll it out in June. Uh, and, um, but I want to thank you for your testimony. It's very accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden. Uh, I was listening to the commissioner. I was very glad to hear it. Um, perhaps what was more important was that I heard it uh, at a meeting when I was face to face with the commissioner. And that was very important. We looked each other in the eyeballs, just as we're doing right now. And I said, June, huh? And June it is. And we are now announcing it to the world. So we are all making book on it. And it couldn't be more critical. I really appreciated that you are uh, you know, saying to her now, make this happen, that you were expressing some skepticism, because we in the disability community have been very skeptical and for good reason. This has been going on since 2017 at the very latest. And quite frankly, we've been advocating for it before then, but that's when serious discussions were taking place. And we've been told one date and another date and another date and another date. So again, looking you in the eyeballs, make it happen. I too was very impressed with how forceful a personality you have, so I know you're going to make it happen. And, and just to be really clear, to put it into a context, I mean, I think my colleague gave it a great context, but let's, let's think about what would you do, Chair Holden, what would you do, Commissioner Tisch, if, God forbid, there were a fire right now? Immediately, getting out the cell phone, calling 911, and we're all going to be saved. What are my colleagues sitting over there going to do who cannot call? Okay, you're there to help them, that's great. What if they're at their homes and they don't have you to help them? What if my colleague here can't be made to be understood because of a stuttering episode? What about the person with an asthma attack that stops it? There's so many people with disabilities to think about. There are also the many people that Mr. Schuyler talked about, the domestic violence, the shooter, the hostage, the, and so on. So these are the real people that we need to be thinking about. This is not just, you know, we, we want to have something on the chart to check off that we would like to have this happen. It means literally saving lives, and it's in your hands, Commissioner Tisch, and we appreciate what you do. And, and I agree with that 100%. And this would be, if when it gets, gets rolled out, uh, New York City, it would be the most advanced step we've taken uh, in quite some time in technology. Because like you mentioned, there's all sorts of horror stories of people not being able to co connect with 911. And there are, people lose lives when, you know, when we can't connect to 911, they're cut off and you know, people perish in, in, in situations, and we've heard so many in domestic violence, like you mentioned. Some people didn't think of that, but in domestic violence, once you pick up the phone uh, and, and somebody, you're getting abused, you're going to get abused some more once you pick up the phone and try to call the police or 911. So that's a given, and that's happened probably thousands of times. So this is a big step forward for New York City, and that's why we're so anxious, Commissioner. I'm glad you stayed and sitting right in the first row. Yeah, no, I tell you that's so. appreciated, too, that, yeah. that you did not just walk out. One sentence. This is one thing that I didn't quite get to say. This is, this is the short text that literally saved a life. I'm deaf. I can't talk on the phone. Need fire department immediately. Fire department arrives. Life saved. This is, this is real. This is not me making stories up. And, and that, that's, that's powerful. Thank, thank you thank for allowing you. me to add thank that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of um, the Spectrum Workers as a private citizen. I think it's appalling that three years have gone by and these workers continue to be on strike. It's a national disgrace. I, it would have been better for most of the council people to hear the message. Unfortunately, some of them have left. Some of them tried to advocate. 
There's a reason why not one single worker is here today. Do you know why? Because they are working three or four jobs. They can barely feed their families. We should be embarrassed that a three plus year strike has continued and no one has reached out to these people. The franchise needs to be ended, period. Nothing else will end this. The only presidential person that's come forward has been Bernie Sanders. We've reached out to the other people. I receive no money for this. I do this out of my heart as a cancer survivor and a 9-11 survivor. Um, I am pleading with you, I'm pleading with the entire council, and I'm pleading the public, with the public at large. We cannot continue this disgrace. This is, a, this is a labor state. We have to protect the workers. Something has to be done, and that something is end the franchise, period. I'd like to speak about one other issue, and it involves 311 complaints. There's a problem with 311 complaints as far as anonymous versus non-anonymous. Again, I'm representing senior citizens who are fearful of calling 311 because of retribution. Landlords and landladies ask them who's called, knocking on their door. Some of them are in their 90s. I have to say that one of the most responsive people has been Corey Johnson, who's the speaker, as far as this issue is concerned. However, there still remains a problem with 311, and let me say what that is. There's a confusion about what is anonymous and not, what is not anonymous. If a door is broken in the front and senior citizens are afraid because there are homeless people sleeping on the sixth floor in the vestibule, 311 needs to be clear about what is anonymous and what is not. I underscore the following. It's very important that seniors be able to report anonymously so there's no retribution, especially for those that are rent-controlled and rent-stabilized citizens. Returning to the spectrum issue, Besides the strike, there's huge, huge amounts of problems in terms of customer service. I know because I'm a Spectrum customer. Those are basically the three things that I'd like to bring to your attention. I am a little saddened that there's nobody sitting here except the chair <laughs> and uh, both council, but these issues really have to be brought to the forefront. I'm willing to stay behind if you have any questions, Commissioner, to clarify, but they're very, very important and critical is that these spectrum strikers be able to feed themselves and feed their children. The franchise needs to end. And we will, I'm a cancer survivor and 911 survivor. I had my thyroid removed. I was one of the first responders in, in a situation where we came downtown and tried to do everything we could with the fire brigade. But um, this, this really needs to be addressed and the franchise needs to be ended. And I thank you for um, remaining and hearing me out <laughs> because there's well, nobody I, yeah. left. But thank you, Professor, and I, and I, and I thank you uh, on behalf of the uh, Spectrum workers who have been on strike for so long, and we don't see really any movement the, uh, the best movement is to end their franchise. Right. That's the single right. best movement. And the single best movement is to all of the council people to support these workers when the next rally occurs. That's the best thing no, that I, we can I do. Agree. I agree 100% and thank you thank, for speaking well, out. Well, thank so you much. so much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Our, is the third, the last one? Okay, our, our final panel, uh, panel number three. Uh, Chris uh, Widelow, Julia Durante Martinez. This is our final panel, last panel. Is Chris here? Oh, okay. Uh, 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 it's against the rules, but uh, I don't know why. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, panel. It was terrific. Thanks for waiting around, too. Is Chris here? Chris Widelow? No, he left? Okay, we have, um, so you have it all to yourself. <laughs> Would anybody else like to testify? You can sign in, okay. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Julia Durante Martinez and I'm campaign coordinator at New Economy Projects. Um, we are an economic justice organization that works with community groups citywide uh, to fight discriminatory economic practices and to support cooperative economics and community-led development. So we and 14 partner organizations are part of a citywide community land trust initiative 
that seeks $1.5 million in discretionary funding to develop community land trusts and permanently affordable housing, commercial space, and other community needs. So we ask the Committee on Land Use to recommend funding for the CLT initiative uh, in the city budget for fiscal year 2021. Community land trusts are a proven model to combat speculation and displacement, protect public subsidy, and facilitate community-led development. Um, a CLT is a nonprofit that owns and stewards land in the community's interest and leases use of that land for affordable housing and other community needs. And CLTs ensure permanent affordability of their housing through 99-year ground leases. Um, the flexibility of the CLT model can support any land use. Uh, CLTs in New York are working to develop permanently affordable housing, but also um, many are incorporating commercial uses, community and cultural space, community gardens, um, open space and green infrastructure into their CLT plans. And one thing to flag, um, especially for the Land Use Committee, is that CLTs engage their members in meaningful decision making over neighborhood and housing development. And this is through their governance, um, their community organizing, leadership development and other stewardship activities. So they facilitate uh, broad community participation in land use and planning decisions and ensure that development meets local needs. Um, so we really appreciate the City Council's support of community land trusts, uh, including through discretionary funding um, in fiscal year 2020. Uh, and this support has bolstered a dozen emerging CLTs that are doing deep community education and organizing, holding workshops and visioning sessions, developing grassroots leadership, and securing additional legal and technical assistance. Uh, so expanded discretionary funding uh, for 2021 will allow groups to build on this progress as they move toward incorporating their CLTs and acquiring properties for long-term community stewardship. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your excellent testimony, and we certainly need a more affordable housing in New York City. It's getting worse and worse by the day, so thank you for staying, and yeah, thank nice. you for the, uh, the testimony. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, this uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.